We shouldn't talk about this on the pod. <laughs> we shouldn't talk about this on the pod? We should not talk about our, like, expensive juice habits on the pod. Look, I, as the as the bevy boy, I gotta <laughs> say. Yeah, you're free. <laughs> the more, like, because I think, especially as someone who doesn't drink alcohol, that doesn't mean I don't want to spend, like, $12 on a drink. Right. Like, if anything, yeah, one of the best parts of drinking was, like, oh, this cocktail costs the same as buying a 12-inch from a local band, <laughs> except it's going to be over in 15 minutes. Right. That's, that's like, so bougie and just feels so good. So wrong, yet so right. So, rather, so uh, rather than supporting the scene, you've just transferred everything over to... To, like, turmeric juices. and carrot <laughs> bullshit juices. It's so good. That's so good. Uh, okay, should we record? <laughs> Yeah, I am recording. Oh, I am recording. Okay, great. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, welcome to Blink-155, the internet's only Blink-182 podcast, mostly dedicated to juices and uh, debating whether or not whether or not South Park is in fact good or very bad. Oh yeah, that is quite a thing. I don't know if we I don't know if we should tread into. We've already kind of thrown down the gauntlet on that with our own opinions. We um, have, but you made this one, comment on Twitter. And once Twitter. again, one of us is on the right side of history and the other <laughs> is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I recognize that like I am constantly staking out the like quietly problematic uh, you know, perspective on things like Joe Rogan and South Park, so I, I should stop talking for sure. <laughs> In general, I'm, as, a, as a rule, but specifically when it comes to these things, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. What did I say on Twitter? Oh, I don't know. Oh, just that uh, this the South Park debate has become this like incredibly divisive debate within the nation. So we have, you know, a, a, a really robust and, and, and incredible community of people who share our passion for. I'm putting this in, in air quotes. The band Blink One Eighty Two and whatever the fuck it is that we 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 do on this podcast. And generally, it sort of seems like everybody's been sort of holding hands and singing Kumbaya and, and moving into this bright and beautiful future together with us. But South Park, like, may be the thing that finally sort of pits brother against brother yeah. in the nation, you know? <laughs> wow, interesting that you uh, think that everyone I, in the I nation is a male. I fucking knew, yeah, I knew, <laughs> look at, I was, Pretty, it was uh, a Civil War reference. It was, it was trying to be historical and clever. Oh, good. Because, yeah, because history is good, isn't it? You think that all history <laughs> is good. Yeah, I think I think both sides of the Civil War had a great point. <laughs> Speaking of very recent history, I must apologize to everyone. Um, I think it was – I can't remember when we last recorded. It feels like it's been a long time. But there was a period – I felt the same way, yeah. There was a period of time where um, we recorded like three exclusives and an episode – and I think, it, yeah, it was for, like, our biggest – one, probably one of our biggest hits yet, which was uh, Feeling This. Yeah. And, and around that time, I had done some interviews for work. And normally when I do a phone interview, I use my, like, little handheld voice recorder. But right. I'm – I don't know if anyone's noticed this yet just based on listening to me talk. But I'm extremely a piece of shit slob of a man. Um, and I couldn't find my voice recorder because it was like still in my backpack from like a trip that I went on three months ago or something. I don't know. I couldn't find it. I didn't have any batteries. And I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to use my podcasting mic to record my phone to record these interviews. And it worked out great. But in order to do so, I cranked up the gain on my microphone and then completely forgot about it. So it happened to be the week where we did like oh, the f- biggest four potential <laughs> episode yeah. and and three other episodes. So there's been a lot of like very high gain, like hearing all the inner noises of my mouth lately. Um, <laughs> I just want to apologize because it's we do have a level of intimacy in our relationship between listener and uh, the what's the opposite of listener? Talker. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of intimacy in this relationship, but I didn't. I mean, I feel like you shouldn't be hearing my molars. Like, you can hear my <laughs> cavities forming through the mic. Yeah, I definitely sort of have a mental map of the inside of your mouth and throat now <laughs> from those episodes. And it's worth saying that because we batch recorded those, I think there's still one more episode to come where the <laughs> yeah, game is so. fucking nuts. <laughs> so look forward to that. Uh-huh. 
So there's that. And then um, another housekeeping thing is, and this was sent to us forever ago, but again, just everything has been fucking crazy lately. Wait, can I just jump in here while we're talking about sound quality? Yes. (laughs) Which is that finally this episode, presumably, and admittedly we haven't finished yet and we don't know what has gone wrong uh, technologically. (laughs) But uh, you and I both have colds. So uh-huh. this episode is going to sound fine, but at least like my voice I'm aware of is like very nasal and stuffed up. And um, I'm just going to be drinking that cold pressed juice. Maybe I should turn up the gain again so you can hear it fight the... <laughs> fight I want to hear that juice go like through your whole body. <laughs> <laughs> like I want to know, ver- know a half hour through the episode, like, where's the juice at? <laughs> where's the juice at? That's good. I should start contact micing my entire body while I do this yeah. so that you can... I mean, that is honestly, even if they don't want to admit it, that is what the people want. <laughs> I think so. I mean, like, podcasts are all about, um, again, that, that sort of intimate relationship. And I think there's nothing more intimate than knowing where's that juice at, which is <laughs> definitely going to be <laughs> a, tag, ca- a tagline that I try to make happen now. <laughs> yeah, that's the new catchphrase <laughs> of the – I mean, now, please, that better be a, a Twitter account by the end of this. Where's that juice at? <laughs> where's that juice at? Just one of those real time, you know, those those Twitter accounts that do like like there was one that was doing a real time uh, tweeting of the Toronto Blue Jays uh, 92, 93 World Series runs. Which oh, yeah, was I definitely funny. know all about that one. I know. But we'll and there's it another ones religiously. <laughs> OK, OK. Or, or, stor- or Twitter accounts. that I, follow. I storified it sometimes <laughs> when it was a good when they had a good run. I storified it. Yeah, it's important. Or like, you know, Apollo missions. I've seen people do that where it's like a real time tweeting of like Apollo 9 or some shit. So I like I would suggest that a great Blink-155 Twitter account would be uh, real time tracking of where's that juice where's at. The juice at? <laughs> well, speaking of where the juice is at, uh, I don't know why that works as a, I don't as know a transition. <laughs> I mean, we'll let history decide. Um, but <laughs> there is from a long time ago. Uh, another no. I this is what I need to say first. So okay. Blink One Fifty Five is. I'm not going to give anything away. But <laughs> what is Blink One Fifty Five, Josiah? I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but one part of what it is becoming, yes, is a record label. Yeah, because in addition to something that's happening right now that you'll find out about soon, uh, there's also next year. And we've only briefly talked about this, but I'm announcing it right now to you as well. But next year, we're going to do a free punk lyrics compilation cassette. Yeah, man. We got to do it. Because it's already mostly there. And I, I mean, I don't know if you're going to do it or not, but definitely we'll get some prenup on there. And maybe we oh, can we'll do some definitely JB. Do one. Yeah, totally. So, so everyone, if you want to make a free punk lyrics thing, like in the next couple months, I'm going to set a deadline and then we'll press some tapes and then sell your own music back to you. <laughs> and just, <laughs> just, to, just to be seeker sensitive here for a second, Free oh, Punk yeah, Lyrics is a you. Tumblr that Josiah started, freepunklyrics.tumblr.com. They're all... Started uh, with my friend Alex. Yeah, he credit is, to Alex. A lot, of his, a lot of the songs that people are doing are his ones, actually, which, I mean, I'm not hurt, but I'm just pointing it out. And these are punk lyrics that you guys wrote in five minutes or less. They are very punk and very lyrics. Um, and extremely free for you to enjoy and interpret in your own way. And we've been playing them uh, throughout uh, the last, I mean, at least a couple of months of the pod. And they've been really, really fucking good. Yeah, like so, I can't believe people keep doing it. Someone even did one uh, in the Instagram DMs. And it was like an acoustic what? one. Just yesterday. And I was like, yo, can you send this to me so I can play it on the pod? And he was like, oh, sorry, the file is too big to email. Never mind. <laughs> so there's, there's even just what? Free, free punk lyrics that just exist in the cloud that are just like a flash and are over, like an expiring oh. um, Snapchat sort of thing. But this one was sent to me uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and it, it was just sent by – oh, fuck. I should probably get the name here. Uh, no, I'm not going to be able to find it because I'm – You don't want to be like Indie 88 here. Come on. Oh, my we God. Well, it's not – but the thing is it wasn't – sources. It wasn't written by this guy. He was like, I'm just the messenger. So we don't actually know who did this. Oh, so this is like a, a sort of – like a Jandek kind of scenario? Exactly. Like, like it could be anyone. I mean I guess I'll just let you uh, <clears throat> vamp while <laughs> I figure out who sent me this. But um, I just sent you the link. Sick. So, so this is actually going to come out because I know, like, we had sort of talked about doing something with it, but the idea of putting out a proper tape release is very exciting. And while I'm vamping, the sort of secret 
that you have been sort of sending me bits and pieces of. I got these like late night messages from you regarding the secret is another reason which uh, I know we talk about the socials a lot, but there's certainly a lot of people that download this podcast. Maybe they download it and don't listen to it and that explains it. But if you are listening to this podcast and not following Blink 55 on Twitter and Instagram, and you know, maybe you even want to join the unofficial Blink 55 Facebook nation group, there's a lot of ways to engage, but I would say like the, the Twitter page is, is where probably like we'll start announcing some of this stuff. So um, give it give it a follow if you need more of this in your life, which maybe not you sure fucking whatever don't, Sam just said. That. I'm back now. I'm back. Okay. So you can stop vamping. Um, OK, this was sent to us by Matthew, whose uh, Twitter name is M. Busby O'Connor, and he's from Victoria, B.C. But he said he's just the messenger. So I'm not really sure. But this does point into something else, because um, famously, in the feeling this episode, we talked about uh, Richard Cheese, and then we talked about it again by accident on the Sclusi. Um, but everyone was making fun of me for not pointing out that his name is Dick Cheese, obviously. Yeah, and I like that people were making fun of you. Like, that's obviously the the, the thing that you were supposed to realize. Like, no one had thought that... Because that involves wordplay, which everyone knows is extremely right. not my forte. And dicks, um, which also is right. not your forte. No, unfortunately for me. Um, but so this uh, this is credited to Richard Power, but then the Bandcamp is dickpower.bandcamp.com. Um, and once again, this is a cover of the most, I think this is the most popular one, and I'm pretty sure this was written by Alex, but I can't actually remember. But So this is a cover of Service on My Own Terms from freepunklyrics.tumblr.com. <laughs> Love the pod. Fuck I all just fascist re- app manufacturers. <laughs> it, it's a good slogan, and it's way better when it's English. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, so Dick Power is uh, at least according to Bandcamp credited to being from London. Uh, I'm so glad that Free Punk Lyrics has entered the realm of like um, turbo post punk kind of thing. Like this is like <laughs> yeah. it's pretty hip now, actually. Uh, that kind of sounded like old, like 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 first record Devo to me too. Totally. So, Dick Power, be careful. You might get signed. Um, but either way, <laughs> that'll be right. on the tape that we're going to put out next year. Um, yeah. So, I mean... It's so interesting that, like, we've had these free punk lyrics covers that have come from all over the world, right? We've got, oh you know... God. We have this one. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. <laughs> this, we, we, like, th- this uh-huh. one you mentioned sort of came via Victoria, um, but yeah. the cover's actually from London. Uh, I think we've had others, you know, from, from all over America, ones from Canada. But I wonder, Josiah... Can't go back to Sacramento. <laughs> Thank you.
while there may not be uh, wordplay this week, there is a little bit of number play because we're finally at the sex number this week. No, we're not. Yeah, we Isn't are. Isn't this no? This is episode sixty-eight. Yeah, sixty-eight is when. <laughs> okay, you know those. <laughs> and okay, I have, yeah, go on. I have been on. thinking about this for about two weeks, so please <laughs> allow me this. <laughs> okay, you know those pictures of like there's like a decrepit old lady, and she's super wrinkly and ancient looking. Yeah. But then okay. if you look at it upside down, it's like a beautiful princess. Right. Okay. Right, so yeah. if you have sex with one of those things, then you're 60 80 because they have two heads. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the number 68 is the sex number <laughs> for that reason. And so how long have you been thinking about this for? I mean, it's a commonly known sex <laughs> number. <laughs> right. What are those things called? Like that that sort of like I I feel um, like it's only that I one trick. image too. Yeah. Like you never see it with like dudes or I don't know. I mean, is that is that some shit that we can be woke about? You never see it with I, dudes, <laughs> the upside down uh, picture trick. Any op- any opportunity that we can take to like try to be woke and then have someone eventually smack <laughs> me down, like and be like, Sam, in your attempt to be woke, you were actually quite racist. Um, it's not I think even it's something good. you can like. How do you even search that? Like it's like old old woman, young woman trick. Is what I would. Oh yeah, recommend. you're right. Optical illusion. Oh, uh, that's what. What was I calling it? An eye trick? Jesus Christ! Wait, yeah, this the, is going to be a bad episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're like our guest spot is so smart this week. Well, with that, in that sense, because I actually the feel intro quite is really freed. smart too. So it's like maybe people are going to be too smart by the end of this, and then <laughs> that's, that's going to be a problem. That we 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 can't educate <laughs> anyone um, more than they could handle. The their brains could explode. Now, I'm not really seeing the – it doesn't even look upside down to me. Okay, hold on. Old woman, young woman. It's old woman or young lady, but I remember there being an upside down one. So that even spoils my number. Oh, here – okay, yeah, here we go. This is the one. (laughs) You found it? Okay, well, you should definitely tweet that so people understand what you're talking about. But tweet it (laughs) Tweet it now so Uh, (laughs) – Just tweet it now. It becomes one of those things that – the number 68. And then people will get all horny. It's true. We might get shut down for violating Twitter's terms of service. Not like you're allowed to post like nudity and stuff on there, but if you make people too horny, then you get in trouble. So nudity's fine, but ho- horny is not. It can't be sexualized nudity, which is kind of <laughs> Hor- what you're doing right now. Hor- hornity. Hornity. Yeah. So San Diego by the band Blink One Eighty Two is a song it's that a, we. It's ast- Will Ferrell season, San Diego. I love lamp. Um, well, how do you feel? <laughs> how do you feel about the song San Diego? Uh, I, by believe, Blink I believe the song's meaning is a whale's vagina. <laughs> this is going to be your bit for the whole episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to do Anchorman shit the whole time. <laughs> uh, Here, the song is obviously so good. It's. So and I'm fucking almost, good. I almost don't even want to talk to you about it because I can just imagine how you're going <laughs> to fucking go off. You're well, going to just like while out. You know how I'm going to go off about it because looking at my own Twitter history, you I've tweeted at you about this song like a dozen <laughs> times. Like before we ever started this podcast, you and I had engaged extensively. I mean, about Blink, but most, you know, most noticeably about San Diego. Like, this I is mean, a big deal for me, apparently. Yeah, like, is this our only thing that we actually have in common, other than, like, <laughs> hating certain me- Canadian media people in private? Yeah. Is, that, I mean, is I, this <laughs> it? Like, is that all we have? Is that why? I think our relationship is very much built around Blink-182. Yeah. <clears throat> Are yeah. you upset by that, or is that okay? So is Maddie you? Rendell, the little uh, Australian fan of the pod who... Who is just this proves how much he blindly supports everything we do, has already liked the picture of the upside down woman oh. named sixty eight. And he doesn't maybe even he, know what it means. Well, maybe he's just horny. <laughs> maybe. Oh, he I know why, because he lives down under. Hey. And so he he oh, sees wow. the beautiful woman instead of the <laughs> grotesque <laughs> I'm kidding. Jeez. Maybe maybe you're attracted to the 
old woman who sort of looks like Mr. Magoo with like a Kermit the Frog neck. <laughs> it's, yeah, we don't understand. Like for, for you to assume the sort of like sexual proclivities of anyone in the nation, I think is a tremendous reach and, it's and true. maybe quite problematic. problematic. Yeah, I think exactly. so. Maybe, exactly. Perhaps it's my views that are upside down. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> the upside down, stranger things. <laughs> Keep calm and stranger things. That's uh, <laughs> there that's, we go. that's your motto. Uh, so yeah, San this... Diego. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I don't actually think I loved it at first very much, but it was wife of the pod, Sarah, who made me see the truth. Because she's really like, she is much more willing to feel things when she experiences media than I am. I just try to think about why it's all bad when I is do she it like, at first. Is she like the earnest man of your relationship? Definitely when it comes to, like, media, for sure. Like, she definitely enjoys things that are, quote-unquote, emotional more. (laughs) And I like things that are, like, I don't know. I don't like anything. So that's why. But then she sort of brought me around, and I'm like, yeah, okay, this is actually very good and so earnest. I noticed in doing a bit of an excavation of my my own Twitter history as it pertains to San Diego that – I have, and I was exaggerating, but I have tweeted three times about this song, and then there's another thread that I'm in where hey, San Diego. I have Diego's a question actually because I've noticed something about your tweets, um, and uh, other pe- and other people who like to tweet about th- about things that are like, like just tweeting about all the stuff they like. Did you ever tweet about this? There's like this colon that you guys do where you're like, the it's like you're determining what you're defining. Whether or not it's good, you're like the song is colon good. Did you ever do that about this song? I did not do. A There's like, like the earnest, the earnest man colon. San Diego is good. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like do the, that, but I've done it, that. I feel like that does need like a grammatical title because it's like it's the earnest music fan colon. Yeah, it's well. Yeah, it's like the the earn. The, yeah, earnest. Col- the a very earnest colon sounds. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a movie I might be interested in watching, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. It needs like a cooler name, like uh, like the Intero Bang or whatever. Like when when they full on just invent new types of punctuation, right? So so perhaps they, that 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 can be a Twitter contest. If you come up for a name uh, with a name for the well, maybe earnest, it's like punctuation with a K because it usually it is usually like. Hold steady fans who do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a very hold steady move for sure. The hold it's steady like are org core. good. The org core com- the org core colon. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh yeah, that, I mean that those are some good ideas. Nothing's really sticking for me yet. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. I've, yeah. So you didn't so, do the col- you didn't do the colon on it. I did but what, not. But what did you tweet? Let's let's okay. let's unpack this. So first of all, though, what I realized is, and I'm going to have to find it now because I actually realized I'd navigated away from it. But uh, there's definitely a thread between you and me and Sarah where you're about to interview um, James Franco before uh, James <laughs> Franco. <laughs> you're the bad one this week, eh? <laughs> So Fuck. you were going to interview James Franco and, <laughs> and, part out. and I, and I am not going to, and, uh, and I suggested, this was like early in the pod and I was <laughs> You're like, like, and I suggested don't do it. There could be allegations. I've, I've heard some rumblings and perhaps it is, uh, you shouldn't be giving him this publicity just, and you didn't listen. You said, I don't care. Uh, you're like, I don't James care Franco about victims. is colon bad. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I asked what song you were going to talk to him about, and Sarah immediately responded with San Diego. So Sarah wanted you to talk to James Franco about the song San Diego, which to me is a sign that she she shares my my deep and real passion for this song. Yeah, she loves it. So uh, one of my first tweets about California, which came on July 4th, 2016, uh, this album, of course, was released on July 1st, 2016, is uh, the new Blink is loaded with chaff, but every second verse where Skiba takes over lifts my heart. Oh, my God. <laughs> Come <laughs> yeah. on, man. Lifts my colon heart. It, I mean, it did. That's how it felt. <laughs> um, <laughs> it lifts my colon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It lifts my org core colon. Um, <laughs> plus, the San Diego chorus is a monster. And uh, and then you respond with a joke about Los Angeles, and 
And then I, I, I respond to you later on by saying, uh, San Diego is the best tune, though. Oh, I used tune. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Anyway, I then respond to you and I say that San Diego is the best. And then, like, friend of the pod, Nicole gets in the mix and says, legit, Matt sounds so awesome on here. And then, like, it's all kinds of – then friend of the pod, Ben Connolly, starts talking about his skiba oh, haircut. Ben Connolly is, the, I believe, the person who sent the free punk lyrics through Instagram. Pretty sure. Oh, so he's been do- he's been doing those just on the sly, eh? Just like secretly for me only for an audience of one. <laughs> the things have just been getting so intimate ever since everyone went inside my mouth. That's it. He got in there and he was like, <laughs> "Ooh, I'm gonna show my juice now." Uh, I'm really glad that like the guest this week is presumably <laughs> gonna bring in some new listeners because it's- they can just really <laughs> see what they've been missing out on. Just the I, dumbest shit ever. We're we're gonna get into this, but um, obviously you've seen the description. So the guest this week is is Charlie from Switched On Pop, which whoa, is whoa whoa whoa. You're gonna spoil so, it? Oh, sorry, spoil. I'll bleep <laughs> that out. Uh, so <laughs> th- their podcast is like a very you know nuanced and intelligent look at you know pop songs, both sort of from the past mm. and you sounds know, like a bit present. of a rip off of ours, but it is. It's absolutely um, you know, and I I, I gently chided that. him for that. <laughs> Yeah, up there with the Alkaline Trio one. Yeah, the Alkaline Trio and Switch, Switch on Pop are our nemesis sees now. Anyway, uh, yeah, for sure, like, it was like, oh, this is great. Like, that podcast is, like, pretty popular. And so I'm super excited to welcome all those listeners to our, like, mouth podcast. <laughs> uh, so... Another tweet of mine about this song is uh, in, res- in response. <laughs> you're, like, you're, like, you're like making fun of our podcast for being bad based on the things I say. And then you're like, now back to reading my tweets from three years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, I have another <laughs> another one, uh, which is in response to a uh, former guest of the pod, Jake Goldsby. Uh, who he did the colon the other day, by the way. I'm sure he's definitely a colon man. Uh, <laughs> Where he's deleted whatever tweet I'm responding to, but I'm saying you're talking to the guy who played San Diego over 100 times in less than a week, and I was like, "That's that's kind of insane." And then what I found is uh, I had screen capped my my play count I, at the time. I guess I was using Google Play Music, and so this is again from July 4th. So the record has been out for three days, and I have listened to Rabbit Hole four times. The only thing that matters seven times, and I've and sandwiched between those is San Diego, where inside of three to four days, I had listened to San Diego 133 times. Oh my god, that's yeah. fucked. I I fucking love this song, and but that's everything the other that I thing love, about- I hold so tight. I'm like, uh, what's his name of Mice and Men? You know, the guy you. <clears throat> Kills everything and then um, Mickey Mouse. I, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is another very similar thing to Sarah. Is that when she has this emotional connection to a song, she'll listen to it like infinite times. Yeah, like I, I listen I, to like one third of a song and then decide whether or not it's good, and my opinion never changes, and I just <laughs> don't ever listen to anything else. I mean, that seems that seems like good, too. But, like, I will punish myself. And we've talked about this on the pod before. Like, when we start listening to a song or talking about a song, where I'm like, ooh, I want to listen to that. And I'll go out and listen to Dogs Eating Dogs. Like, only Dogs Eating Dogs for a night. Like, I will do that because I'm damaged, clearly. But So that's what I was doing with San Diego is I was just, like, looping it. And... I have no regrets, and even listening to the song before we started recording, I was like, I still fucking love this song. Yeah, I actually listened to it like three times in a row as well. Um, so, yeah. I'm surprised you like it, because this feels like so deeply earnest, and this seems like the sort of song that you maybe could have liked if it came out like when you, during a more innocent time for you, but I'm surprised that like, you know, cynical adult Josiah connected emotionally with the song. Well, first of all, I identify as post-cynical now, now that I'm okay. an Ide- Imagine Dragons fan. Sorry, um, yeah. And I'm also a 21 Pilots fan now, too. Um, <laughs> so I'm post-cynical. But uh, I think it's probably because of the huge pre-chorus again. Like, a pre-chorus will do everything for me. I'm just, I can't deal with how good the pre-chorus is. And then it just makes the chorus hit that much harder. And it's just a sick song. I don't know. But it why, why are you very... interrogating me? <laughs> Sorry, man. I mean, we could not talk about the song if you want. We could just skip right to the guest part because it's really good. No, I want to keep talking. Okay, cool. I got more so, shit to say. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how you at least felt about the song 
from the start because I, I found listening to it, obviously all of California is this attempt to like recreate sort of Blink's greatest hits to, you know, varying degrees of success. And then the stuff where they're trying to do something different generally is kind of a failure. And so this song is obviously an attempt to do like Adam song or stay together for the kids. So yeah, or one again, of these like, like already tempo right, right there. I agree? kind of disagree because I don't think that I've seen other people say that too. They're like, Oh, I feel like I'm being transported back to 2002 or whatever. Um, I don't know if that means they feel like nine eleven just happened or something, but <laughs> right, they're just <laughs> memories of the towers falling or haunting um, them. <coughs> no, but I think uh, it doesn't really sound like like this doesn't sound like other than yeah, the guitar at the start is a little bit of a Adam song flavor or or Adam of the state flavor just by him playing that like I don't know what that chord is called diminish whatever. Um, Maybe something like that <laughs> is like that. But otherwise, I don't really think it does sound like a Blink song. And again, this song to me sounds like what I imagine or wish Alkaline Trio sounded like. It sounds more like a moody, sad punk song. It's interesting that you say that this is what you wish Alkaline Trio sounded like. Because to me, this song is actually like, vi- like especially contemporary Alkaline Trio, where they're like straight up kind of just a pop band. Like this, this chorus like could be an Alkaline Trio song, except I mean, that it's about cool. Tom DeLonge. Yeah, but then like people will be like, again, that's another thing where people are like, oh yeah, well then I think you really would like Alkaline Trio. Just start here, and I'm like, but I don't have to. Like I don't have to get into things anymore. It's fine. <laughs> right. You, I like you Imagine got, Dragons now. I'm, yeah, I'm you've in got my 21 new Pilots. Zone. You don't need any new new bands, I guess. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I get that. I totally get um, it. The other thing that really helped me like it a lot was. Just listening right now again, I was reminded, like, I think Mark's bass tone sounds really sick. Yeah, it's all like, doo-doo-doo, bo-doo. It's- yeah, it's, like, huge. And it sounds like, like, again, a lot of the tones of everything, it sounds like they're almost plugging into, like, an interface on an Apple Watch. They're like, oh, Apple Watches contain all the amps now. You don't even need to do that. But, like, yeah. it actually sounds like he's playing through an amp. You can, like, almost hear the amp rumbling a little bit. And so that sounds really cool. That Like, all that kind of stuff just lends it an urgency and even well, the way after the bridge the way that it just does the instrumental part where it's just the power chords but it's so huge totally and powerful. yeah i feel like this is a song where like feldman j felds made all the right decisions because like you have these extremely organic sonic elements like like all the t- kind of sick tones you just described but then you have these like like doot, 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 doot. i don't even know what that is right like the little like synth thing yeah, that happens yeah the little weird piano thing and it's fucking awesome and it's super additive and it's like in and of itself like an amazing hook and it's like this throwaway on top of the uh really strong verse melody and that's where, like, I think you can really effectively mash up those things. And, like, you have all these layers. And, yeah, the just straight up just hammering on the chords part sounds so big and, like, important. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just so much going on. And then the lyrics are mostly colon good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dude, <laughs> like, the lyrics of the song are extremely good. Yeah. Like, I mean, I do feel like... Okay, hang on. I haven't even pulled them up. Let's talk about the lyrics in a second, actually. Because I okay. first would like to talk about the band's discussion of it. Um, and there is, of course, as with all California songs, there's a long felt quote. But I'm going to start with Matt Skiba talking about it. So with NME, they did this like track-by-track track breakdown of every song on Cali. Um, and for some reason, I guess maybe because, I mean... We'll talk about it more in a second, but I do feel like Mark is still very emotionally guarded to the point where, in a sense, this song doesn't still feel completely genuine, even though it kind of is. It just, I still feel like he has his guard up a little bit. He's not. Whereas if Tom wrote a song about Mark, it would just be like, or actually, the song the song that Mark wrote about Tom, for plus forty four, that we may or may not be discussing oh. soon. That's so interesting that you're bringing that up, yeah. <laughs> but that one, you're like, okay, his gloves are off. But even in this one, is so, like, sort of wishy-washy. I, I just feel like he's not necessarily coming right out and saying what he wants to say. Maybe. Yeah, well, it, it does, I don't know. I mean, on one hand, it's so obviously about Tom. But on the other hand, there's, like, other 
things where it just feels like he's also trying to throw you, not throw you off the scent. Cause like literally the chorus is like so clearly about Tom, but they've added enough sort of vague lyrical elements where you're like, well, that doesn't sound like it's about Tom. So he can confidently be like, no, it's about, so when Tom joins the band uh, again, as mm-hmm. prophesized by Bill Billingsley and, um, yeah, tonight, uh, right? Like the is that is it supposed to be? Comes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> so, so so anyone who's <laughs> anyone who hasn't been paying attention to the Twitter, Bill Billingsley, uh, Papa of the Pod, literally just lied and said that <laughs> someone from the band told him that Tom was going to be there, and there's been like media outlets contacting him <laughs> and contacting us. <laughs> like, where did? What's your source? This is so exciting, and he's uh, like, it's just he just lied because he rules. <laughs> Um, so good. <laughs> anyways, here's Matt talking about it. And I just, that's what I was trying to say is like, it's kind of, kind of interesting that he let Matt take the reins on this one instead of. Well, I, I wonder, it's like, gives you some distance, right? Yeah. But let's hear, let's hear what they have to say. Or let's not, let's just talk about it. Let's just vamp. I mean, I'm, lo- I'm going to, okay. <laughs> there are songs that were left off the record, not because they weren't great, but because they would change kind of the temperature not kind of completely change the temperature of the record and what kind of record it would be. It's just like a, you know, a different kind, just a kind of a taste thing. And San Diego, I was, I don't know why, but I was concerned it was going to get cut. And I'm really glad it didn't. I think it's such a great song. And there's um, some mixed feelings about San Diego within the band. I won't go into specifics, but it, it I think it, um, expresses those feelings without you know there are you know obviously the band uh you know originates from from san diego and the fans there are just you know amazing so it's not a diss to the city but it's sort of like um if i you know can say so uh similar to me like having memories of chicago that's where i'm from and uh you know coming into blink and having a song that's sort of like a past life type of tune that's so uh so anthemic but also kind of melancholic and and adds this new uh kind of turquoise flavor to the record that i'm i'm a big fan of I'm, i love that song turquoise flavor yeah like o- like kind of dirty ocean flavor cool yeah <laughs> what what's he saying at the end there he said it adds a turquoise flavor to the album um, and then Mark was like, oh, turquoise flavor. I, I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. Listening to Matt Skiba speak out loud does not really help his case in my books. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It's like, I don't it's, know. I just like the idea of, for reasons I won't get into. It's like, yeah, man, this is a very <laughs> famous band. Um, I don't think you need to be that coy, but. <laughs> well, maybe there's more to it. Maybe they. Maybe there's more reasons they have a complicated. Maybe Mark has a bunch of unpaid parking tickets. <laughs> right. It's, it's the city. The like is just you know they're constantly sending in uh, requests for payment. It's uh, it's quite a problem. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean, just what the fuck are you talking about? He's just he, he just does not sound. Uh, I, I just don't think he should be taking the lead on any questions, really. No, it's it's so interesting to have him be the one answer. It's also very interesting to think that this song almost didn't make it when you think that like Los Angeles was a lock. And I feel very comfortable saying this is like the best song on California and like by a by a country mile, as the memorable saying goes. Yeah, what does that mean? I don't know. I guess a country mile is longer than a regular mile. I'm not going <laughs> to look it up. <laughs> it's because are you saying country people are stupid? Yeah, Sounds that's what like I'm it. saying. So people okay. who don't live in cities don't understand how, how to measure, and so they just guess, and they're dumb. Right. Okay. Well, just checking. And that's um, on the record. Uh, but like, I, how, don't know, like, I don't actually don't think it's the best song, but I think it is among the best. Like, I do think there's a lot of really good songs on the album. Although another person, another friend of the pod and friend in real life, my friend Jeremy Curry, he was telling us at the live show... But this is actually, at this point, the only Blink-182 song he likes at all. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> like, everything else has just sort of fallen away, and he's... I guess, or maybe he was never really into them. Like, he's one of the few cherished people who are experiencing the band through this podcast. <laughs> right, and yeah. And bless he... those souls. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. There's just something about the way Matt Skiba talks where, like, when you have this wavering voice where you just I, – I just – I don't know how to explain it. He's like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it's just so like, it's his so voice weird. is also just like hard to pin down because it's it, he has this like hint of kind of proper ass Chicago Midwest accent, and then but he like clearly so badly wanted to be in California and then moved to California and became an actual surfer, and so it's this like mashup of you know various American dialects. So it's like. He also Mid- just Midwest yeah, surfer, and it's uh, it's unsettling. those things, and then it's also he sounds like he's insanely hungover, but also trying to sound academic or intellectual at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it actually reminds me of this viral video of there's this dude. Uh, I mean, it's not really worth playing because it's very visual, but there's this dude who's like <laughs> on local news, um, talking about his film that is opening but he's so hung over from the party before that he just pukes all over the desk and he has like the <laughs> same sort of wavering like hey, it's all oh. <laughs> like I feel like if Matt Skiba puked in the middle of that interview I wouldn't be surprised right you'd be like okay cool Th- this at least now makes sense to me I heard that coming yeah it's all about mouth sounds is what we're learning today <laughs> that's that's the <laughs> that's what this podcast is really about <laughs> <laughs> etymology and, I mean, isn't etymology really just the study of mouth sounds? Whoa, it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's deep, man. So here's what John Feldman had to say to uh, Fuse. He said, Cynical was probably the second to last song we wrote. They love to tell you when they wrote every song. Like, is it that interesting that it's the second to last song? Mm, Do you really need to tell us that? Like, wait, well, why are you reading the Cynical entry? Oh, wait. Oops. Because <laughs> I clicked through to the start of the yeah you got it it's a whole gallery they're really they're Fucking really making enemy you... didn't link to the proper oh I see it's yeah. in the URL but it's not hopping ahead yeah, that's because uh, Fuse TV is looking for those clicks so they made this article a gallery for no oh reason oh my god there's so ma- they're getting so many clicks out of me it, I'm clicking through it this is fucking killing me man holy shit <sighs> how- well at least he didn't say when they wrote this one. <laughs> yeah, it's probably we probably wrote this one. I would say fifth or sixth out of <laughs> yeah. seventeen songs. Yeah, we started uh, it at it like three p.m. Yeah. on a Tuesday. <laughs> that is so interesting. Mm, um, I love the times. Of, <laughs> the history of this song is about growing up in San Diego, no having shit. so many of their work partners being from San Diego. What <laughs> work partners? <laughs> <laughs> that is that feels like a translation thing, right? Like maybe John Feldman did this interview in like German and now <laughs> Or it's just like again like Blink182 is like such a corporation now that like <laughs> Yeah. It's like the Many corporate of their eye for Mad Busters. <laughs> yeah. Uh the CFO of Blink182. <laughs> the documents, really. Yeah. Marketing back to So many of their work partners being from San Diego and having a member who lives in San Diego who is no longer in the band, and that's hyperlinked in case you didn't know who it was. Who? uh, mm, Scott (laughs) Rayner? Yeah. Uh, But anyways, this was a song that Mark didn't want to write. I brought up the idea that you have to write about shit you don't want to write about. You have to write about shit that's right there on the surface. Mm. Damn. Shit. Uh, there's clearly a lot of feelings involved with having a best friend who is not in your band anymore. Having a best friend with all that stuff that went down. Every band has these issues. To write a song now in their minds to go back to San Diego, playing shows and tipping their hat to the city that allowed them to be a band. To me, Blink put San Diego on the map. If you think of its geographic location, they're the band that made San Diego relevant as a city. I say that with the utmost respect to San Diego because I was born in San Diego. I grew up in San Diego, but nobody gave a fuck about San Diego. It was just like a place, and suddenly Blink happened, and it was like Seattle. The song acts as a bittersweet homage. Sorry, I probably said that wrong. Homage. Yeah, honestly, if you had just got – it was like a little off, but it was I know, good enough. Exactly, but it was cl- – but I just knew that the slight <laughs> offness, they were going to get me. You know, yeah. they're just constantly at me. A goodbye to this city that none of us live in anymore but owe so much to while acknowledging the interpersonal relationships within the band. So mm. we'll talk about the putting San Diego on the map thing in a second. Yeah, because that is disrespectful to some very, very good bands from San oh, Diego. I've got a lot of stuff to say about that. But first of all, I don't know. What do you think about being like, this is the song Mark didn't want to write? Uh, He's already written songs that are like, fuck you, Tom. Yeah, but I guess in the... 
in the side projects and probably also when he was younger, like, you know, plus 44 is a long time ago and blink in putting this album together was sort of, you know, trying to re-enter a very commercial sphere so that they could tour, so they could do things like this Las Vegas residency. And so on some level, I think what you want to do is make music that you think is going to be, and I actually don't mean this like as a, as a cynical put down, but you're trying to like make something that people who like your band are going to want to buy, but you're not necessarily looking to like plumb the emotional depths of your soul. Right. It's all, like, it all is all very surfacey for the most part. Yeah. Like, you know, Los Angeles is not like a deeply felt song. Well, now you're just being a dick, but. About poverty or, or something, right? <laughs> and so the idea that for the most part, you're kind of like, you got all these co writers, and, and, and it's not to say that they don't mean it, right? But like, this song feels, and, and I think personally, that's why I think it's such a standout on the record, because like, I actually believe this song. Yeah. In a way that I don't buy any, like, there's songs I like on this record, but like, if I think about it for two fucking seconds, I don't believe it. And we've returned to that on every California episode. Like, that. Yeah. Well, the this thing song is, to me has like a real and authentic emotional core to it. And the th- I agree because actually, I mean, like we do talk about nostalgia all the time, but there are certain aspects of nostalgia that I can't actually cope with. And I can't think of an example right now, but there are things that I like intentionally avoid thinking about too much because I'll just like feel like I'm about to start crying just in terms of like the positive or negative of nostalgia is just so upsetting. So I can see... Even when you read that, like, it is so evocative to be like, think of every person I ever lost in San Diego. Like, that's fucked to not live in the city where you grew up anymore, which is true of me as well. Yeah. How do you think back to all these things that happened and like all the shit that's changed? Everyone's moved away. You like see people and it's either the same or it's weird. There's just like so many elements of it that are like, I can see why maybe it's also not just about Tom, but it's just about like. You grow up as part of this community, and then it's all different and over. And then that's really depressing. And especially if you're the tall poppy, right? Like, I think that that's got to be super, super weird. So it's not just, like, going back to the city and you're like, oh, like, here's our skate spot and here's my high school. And, like, oh, I bumped into someone at the coffee shop and it was weird. It's like you, you know, we, we can talk about the specifics of, like, Blink putting San Diego on the map musically, which is not not true, but from a like macro pop cultural perspective, it is. And so to be so synonymous with the city, not live there and how like, I I actually do believe that like, you know, as weird as it maybe is for you to go back to like, um, where the fuck is tiny town are you from? Abbotsford, right? (laughs) We're friends. Well, not even Uh, there. Like, (laughs) I mean more like even going back to Vancouver because we would just go into Vancouver all the time. Yeah. But it's also like it's different because like Tom stayed in San Diego, so he's seen all these changes happen and he's sort of come to terms with each change as it happens. But if you leave a place and then only go back every few years, you just kind of expect it to be the same in a way that it could never be. So then it's kind of more heartbreaking in a way. Well, maybe. And it- and yeah, totally. I-, I think that's it. Like you don't notice it's like boiling frogs, right? Like you don't notice it if you're in it. <laughs> But if you come back, you're like, this water is boiling. Tom, you're a frog and you're dead now um, <laughs> in that metaphor. Right. I also wonder, and this is getting like extremely granular, how – and maybe they're too popular for this to kind of like be a thing. But like when Mark goes to San Diego – I mean I'm sure he's, he's a famous person. Anywhere he goes, people like would recognize him and be stoked to see him or whatever. But like does he feel that the city is maybe – and I'm extrapolating in a really insane way here, like colder to him than to Tom, because like Tom stayed and like Mark went and became like a fancy L.A. boy. And is there like a friction there as well where like, you know, I, or maybe this or maybe neither of them are respected at the lo- like if you go to L.A. and you're Mark Hoppus, then you're like, oh, you're from a famous band and you're like you are trying to do the right memes at the right time, even though you're way too late. Like he's still, he can just fit in with all the fakers there, but people from San Diego actually know him. So they know maybe his baggage or totally like, it's just kind of like more intense. Yeah. I mean, and it's just like, I I, I think of this, you know, because it's something that, you know, I've, I've been working on, you know, 
like the the schism in this. So this is a tremendous leap, but but maybe try to follow me on this, which is this like schism in the history of the band. So like Robbie Robertson, who like wrote a lot of the songs and Levon Helm, who was like the kind of soul of the band. And they wrote all, all these albums in Woodstock and are kind of synonymous with this particular sort of moment of creativity in the city. And Robbie literally like leaves and goes to L.A. and lives in Malibu and you know, becomes friends with all these famous people and Levon stays. And then if you're a fan of the band, the kind of history is like Levon becomes very bitter and, and blames, you know, Robbie for sort of stealing songwriting credits. And he's kind of destitute. And and there's like a great movie about, you know, Levon that was made a few years before his death. He's he's relatively destitute, but living a, a sort of, quote unquote, more authentic life in Woodstock. And Robbie's off sort of, you know, in, in L.A. being like a fancy kind of rock star. And if you go to Woodstock, like there's like Levon Helm Memorial Highway, like he has roads named after him and everyone loves Levon and kind of hates Robbie. And there's this just like, if you have such a like tremendous impact on a place and then you leave it, people develop opinions about you that have nothing to do with reality. And also that like you have no control over that narrative. Yeah, totally. But also like, it's kind of sick that Mark Hoppus left in his own way. Like, I don't know. It's cool that he's lived in London, too. And he has, like, that's sort of... It's also kind of weird when people are too attached to their city, I think, personally. I totally... I always wonder, because at this point, I'm never going to leave Toronto. And I and I always have kind of wondered if that's, like... You know, and I've had the benefit of, like, touring, and I get to travel for work. And so it's not like I'm, like, a total... It's not like I don't leave, but... I grew up here and I'm going to fucking die here. And I always wonder if that's like, is that, is that something of a failure on my part? And whereas like you, you've, you've moved around at least a little. Yeah. So like I I'm lived in Scotland when I was a little kid and stuff too. Like I've lived, I don't oh. really have one city that I necessarily think is my city except for Vancouver is like where I've spent all my formative years and where I definitely do feel that pang of like, painful nostalgia when I think back to like how good everything was when I was a teen and I hate it I hate nostalgia it's horrible dude nostalgia rules like I I, I'm I don't buy into this like I think nostalgia can be a sickness but I sort of feel like nostalgia is like any sort of like not a hard drug but if it's like you know booze or weed or something where it's like kind (laughs) of tight to like engage with in a limited capacity but you can like you know get a distended kidney and die if you yeah, overindulge I mean, in nostalgia. Well, maybe it, maybe that's maybe nostalgia is the same as drinking for me where I just don't know how to do it like <laughs> in moderation. <laughs> in, yeah, in a good way. Right. But I, it's like I don't know, if I like go through like I don't know, like if I find an old email account and find like old show flyers or just whatever like it's just like after a certain point i'm like i need to stop or i'm gonna start like weeping right now (laughs) it's just like i can't handle the feeling it's too far oh i love it man and i think like i felt differently about it when i was in my 20s like i I really was like nostalgia is poison but i also think people who were like people who immediately graduated from school and then were like nostalgic I, i was like that's fucking weird but like being personally like being in my early 30s now i like fucking love 10, 10 years is a long time, but like 10 years ago, I'm like, oh, there was interesting stuff happening and I like looked different and my friends looked different, but a lot of my friends are the same. And I, I really like that being able to sort of tap back into that. And that's actually where I think the song is really interesting because it sort of is for me quite accurately capturing both sides of that emotion, right? It's capturing the kind of poisonousness of it that you're describing, but it's also capturing the kind of elation this like very natural high that comes from embracing nostalgia. Like hanging out and listening to the songs that you like with your friends. Like to me, like, cause what is that? Like really, if you like go back and when you listen to fucking gob, it's kind of nostalgia, right? It's like a little bit of that. For sure. Like that, like I definitely still love nostalgia. Like, I mean, I still like it, but it's just eventually I always hit a, peak where I'm like, okay, this is too far. I need to stop or I'm going to get depressed. <laughs> it's just like, it is like, yeah, a, you can overindulge for sure. Um, it's like nostalgia is like, a uh, a, a, a beautiful woman, but then if you flip it upside down, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's Kermit the frog or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, do you like the bridge? That's one part of the song where I don't necessarily like. Because I don't know, love the drum pattern. The it's just yeah. a bit. That's where the song gets a bit too corny for me. I would say it is, like, insanely good, but only because <laughs> I love the song. And so I think it is, hand, hands down, the weakest part of the song. Uh, but then I really like that it gets us to, like, throw the ocean blue, and then when it gets... Uh, like to those big crazy again? chords, yeah, like that's it's, so big. I it sort of feels like a necessary, like a necessary route to get there, right? Those big chords at that part are they actually bigger than the chords in the chorus, or is it just without singing they just sound huge? I couldn't tell if there was more layers on there or not. Um, I think they are. I think they are physically bigger chords for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it sort of reminds me of actually the first song of the Chemistry of common life by fucked up there's one part where they just hit power chords where it sounds so huge and i don't know it's not very often that like just power chords sound fucking massive like that totally you know what by the way uh, a little bit of a a nod to uh to chemcom because that album features uh manhattan Henge right on the cover and on the day that you and i are recording uh it it was and i missed it because we were recording uh toronto Henge. so it's 618 today um, uh, on October 25th, not to give away our secrets, but I just did. Uh, it was Toronto Henge. And that shit's interesting as hell, man. Yeah, what does that mean again? It's just where the sun is lined up perfectly with the east west streets. So you get like the effect of like the sun sort of setting like right down uh, Queen Street or right down Bloor Street where the CN Tower is. Bloor and so Street. that. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying like you've never heard it before. Which is crazy. <laughs> what is this Bloor Street you speak of? That's, um, that's not my right. My friend yeah. Carl was just my friend Carl was just in Toronto this week, and he sent me a photo of the Bloor Street sign. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I know you love it's this. Really the, yeah, I love. I fucking love that place. Well, I want to. I'm gonna. We're still gonna st- circle back to the. San okay, Diego I, being the new I do Seattle. want to say, though, about the bridge, though, yeah, it's fucking insane, uh, is that I think why I like it is because generally I think Matt's performance on this song is, like, really fucking good. And so I think again, his delivery how, of the bridge is, yeah. is really good. And so I like Matt. I don't know that I love the it's, – it's definitely the weakest part of the song, for like sure. Like, the drums are just stupid. The drums sound like the Nutcracker or something. <laughs> yeah, it's very Nutcracker. But when you hear Matt Skiba do this, like, beautiful yelp that he does in this song, and then you hear him in interviews do his warbly, like, cigarette man voice, I don't – it's just so funny that it's the same guy. <laughs> cigarette man. Yeah. <laughs> he is He is the cigarette smoking man. Does, does he smoke? Because also that's the other thing is, like – I don't know. Mark, sometimes I feel like I'm the oxygen b- between the cigarette and gasoline. Is that a good lyric or no? I can't even tell. I think it's fucking great. And and spoiler alert, we do talk about that lyric in the guest spot, so you can get your opinion out, but know that there's uh, like I don't, a, I don't, a I real genuinely, nuanced dissection of it coming that's up. That's great, because I genuinely don't have an opinion, so I'm, I'll find out when I cool. listen. Well, someone involved in this podcast does. <laughs> um, it's not really so, me. It's the guest. It's fine. So I don't, is there anything else you want to say about the lyrics? Uh, no, they're fucking great. Like, uh, well, yeah, I do. I want to say this, which is I love lyrics that reference, uh, like actual real world things. So this like evoking the cure is, I, again, I, I recognize that it's like very ham handed, but I think there's always something really fun about like watching a, a movie or a TV show where they reference, and this is so bad, but like referencing another piece of pop culture. And this has become way. Stranger things. Yes. <laughs> That's why this <laughs> podcast is so good. It's become like way too common and, and just like a crutch to, to, to like reference something and try to like pull the emotion from that thing. Like be like, if I reference something, that's as good as evoking the emotion of that thing. And that's that's lazy and terrible. But I think there's something really neat about um, pieces of culture that are set inside of our own culture, because so often it feels like TV shows and movies are like happening in kind of an alternate dimension, even if they're not like sci- sci-fi. And yeah, so like it's, it's you're right. It's, cor- it's sometimes it feels corny when they reference real things. But then when you watch something and they're like referencing a made up version of it, they're like, oh, are you watching uh Keeping up with the 
Kusnarfians? <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> wow. wow. That was like something <laughs> I would have said, dude. That was brutal. You really have a cold. The, on the 90210 reboot, they were playing this like video game. I think it was supposed to be Call of Duty, but it literally just looked like like Windows 3.1. 3D mm-hmm. animation. It, it was so shitty. Yeah. And you're just like, why don't you just fucking talk to someone and get a license for any video game? It'll be yeah. better than whatever you've done. It's not that hard. So, yeah, like I always, this is, I recognize again that this is like a, a problematic band. But like early on when I got really into brand new, like they were one of the first like punk bands that I'd heard like really do that, where like a lot of their Imagine old stuff if you just got into brand new like, <laughs> like now, two months ago. Right. So well, I was really like, got who's this Jesse Lacey new. guy? <laughs> You know, I don't news click on headlines usually, but I've seen his name popping up a lot, and I thought I'd check him out. I just wanted to know what all the fuss and muss was about. So they were sort of one of the first, uh, and I'm sure there are tons more, but like kind of contemporary pop punk bands that I thought did that in a way that was like really interesting. And the Ataris also did did the same thing as well. And 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 uh, actually, I think at least in some of those cases, it was also referencing The Cure because that's like the non punk band that I guess all the punks liked, but. I just, I really, I think it's like a really strong lyric, despite the sort of unnecessary specificity of it. And yeah, I, and it's kind of like on one hand, you're. I would initially, I think I thought like, oh, the Cure. That's a bit of like a too obvious of a reference. But at the same time, like knowing Mark and knowing that he really did get into music through the Cure, and he's he doesn't really seem like the kind of guy who like actually had esoteric tastes and really went too deep like i feel like he's always liked like the big pop band of whatever genre he's into yeah so that that, so the cure is kind of like the perfect choice for that lyric yeah and if you look at like matt skiba like that's a real like pop goth man who for sure was in it so like i also it's believable in a mark song and also in a mark song that's being sung by matt skiba like it doesn't feel like a stretch where they're trying to be like i was at the fucking um (laughs) rocket from the crypt show and yeah. you're like, you fucking guys did not go to Rocket from the Crypt Shows. It's fine. <laughs> More on that in a second. But uh, I know. First, I'm teasing up to it. Um, first, so this is like a heartbreaking song. Uh, and the, the main hook, despite the, the fact that they talk about going to San Diego, the main hook is really can't go back to San Diego, right? I mean, would you say that? That's the... Y- yeah, of it, kind of can't, can't um, go back. Yes. Well, that that can't has been edited out so that it can be used for this Major League Baseball commercial. What? <laughs> Are you so, serious? Yeah, I just sent it to you. <laughs> so uh, this is uploaded on MLB TV. Of course, baseball being the ultimate pop punk pastime. <laughs> yeah. Um, get ready for the 2016 T-Mobile Home Run Derby. Oh, love the Home Run Derby. Featuring Blink-182 song San Diego. So I believe <laughs> they've edited out the can't. So, so it's just, you can't, oh, you that's can so go funny. Back. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> if it'll ever load here. Um, well, here it, we go. Okay, it's loaded. It's fine. Where's the audio? <laughs> Is an amazing edit. It's horrible. Oh, wow. In the context of that, the song is just all of a sudden terrible. Well, this has got to be like the only song that is about San Diego. I don't. I'm not going to do any research to figure out if that's true. But they were like, "Look, this is all we got. The only one we, we can get." This and we have to make it bad parts. positive, yeah. Because it includes, like, <laughs> bits of the other lyrics. So it's like, but it doesn't include, like, like, losing the- anyone or... <laughs> and then all of a sudden in the context of a baseball game, singing about listening to your favorite song in the parking lot is just so corny and makes me think of uh, tailgating parties. Totally. Which are, like, probably fun for you and your boys or whatever, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know, it's not like a... This, this song had so much depth before, and now it's just, like... <laughs> No, yeah, it, it totally strips it of any, like, meaning whatsoever. That's funny. 
I love that. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> awful, but I wonder how much they got paid for that. I mean, probably enough to make it worthwhile because like, especially given that that is like the song on the album that maybe has the most like <laughs> real meaning to just completely <laughs> neuter it is. It's kind of sick. It's actually pretty fucking sick. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I mean uh, is. Oh, the city. The city and this sort of. Feldy's notion that Blink-182 put them on the map and everything. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I'm wondering if this actually, this website might even have something to do with you, because I, I feel like it's started by your friend Snoop Dogg. Um, but this this sort of online culture blog called MaryJane.com. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this like, do you own this website or something? I don't, I do not own this website, no. But Okay. We work with the people who run this website. <laughs> That's what I thought. But uh, this is actually a pretty interesting article written by Justin O'Connell. Uh, tip of the hat to you. Yeah, I love your – uh, I love sliders. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so this, <laughs> this article is called uh, San Diego Loves to Hate Blink-182. It's kind of a review of the album. Right. Um, he doesn't talk about the this song until towards the end. Basically, San Diego hints at drama and lost friendships in Blink 182's birthplace. But most notably, if you read the first paragraph, San Diego loves to hate Blink. A documentary made about the city's 90s post punk scene climaxes in interviewees expressing dismay with the band's success. The film then cuts to an interview with former Blink darling Tom DeLong, who is also perplexed at why his band, instead of, say, San Diego's Rocket from the Crypt, mm. sold more than 35 million albums worldwide. <laughs> and so I looked up this documentary, um, and it seems pretty sick. Yo, I, called, would, I would love to watch this documentary. It's called It's Gonna Blow. Um, here's the website for it. And I found... The full thing's not online, but it's, it's, uh, sorry, I'm all over the place right now. <laughs> so it's, it's between 1986 and 1996. It's mostly about like the Locust, Gravity Records stuff, um, Rocket from the Crypt, Truman's Water, which partly became the amazing Christian music, uh, concern soul junk. And so it's like about all kinds of shit that I love. Is Pinback also- from San Diego? Yeah, yeah, we'll Holy get to that in a shit. second, actually. Oh, but sorry. so Tom DeLong, um, there's unfortunately he's not online. It's from 2015, but there is. I found one clip of Tom DeLong talking about it from one of the trailers, so I'll play you that. Um, but yeah, like this is finally this seems to have the missing link between all the Locust Spazcore stuff and Tom DeLong. We finally. This has been like since since day one. The pod has sort of <laughs> been about these bands too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So here's Tom talking about it. And you can be different from one another. One guy is naked with his dick in the air. And then you have some guy that looks like Spock. And then you have these little kids that are singing about dicks with sideways hats. They're kind of like, well, what the fuck? What is this place? <laughs> so that's the only quote. But I love that he mentioned Spock and dicks. I mean, there you go. <laughs> that's all you need. That's it. That was, if I may say, always a bad haircut. <laughs> yeah, but. Did you have I it when you were like in one of these bands? Mm, I did. I did used to dye my hair black, or sometimes like the bluey black. Did you? you get. Sick. But I never. My hair is too like thick and curly. I could never get true Spock look. So I just always looked kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, that was my favorite. Was like kids who would go kind of halfway on it. Like they'd they'd sort of like comb their hair in a way, but then like not straighten it. So it was just like very messy and stupid looking. <laughs> yeah. It's like no. Like if you're gonna do this, you have to commit. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But I just, I don't know. I just love that, like, all the Spock Rock bands are in a documentary with Tom DeLonge. And it's interesting that they only got Tom. And is that because they made it after Tom had left Blink? So he was, like, able to be, like, to talk about it maybe more candidly? I don't think so. Because it, well, he does look to, he looks like kind of current era Tom. Like, he has, like, a American flag behind him. And he's wearing a really awful leather jacket. I wonder how um, Trombino feels about it. Because, like, really... You know, so context, obviously, Mark Trombino was in Drive Like Jehu and Drive Like Jehu, you know, seeds all, all many like really exciting San Diego post hardcore bands. 
And he produces the album that basically like puts Blink on the map um, in the form of Dude Ranch. Yeah. So I like how does do, do you think like does like John oh, Reese hate it. Mark Trombino? He's not listed in the so that's there interesting. There is some there is some I know that there is some like John Reese Mark Trombino shit that went down. Yeah. But I mean like literally like name a San Diego band and they seem to be in this documentary. Yeah, it's but got it, Antioch also, like, Arrow, it's got Boilermaker. This looks sick, man. Swing Kids. I want to see this fucking movie. Yeah, and you can rent it on uh YouTube movies or on like any of those things sick i mean part of me is like i feel like i've seen this movie so many times but there's also so many bands in this that i want to see them talk about it that i'll probably watch it too the thing is like i could watch all of like i love watching these fucking things part of me is just like and it's kind of what i'm saying about nostalgia too it's like at a certain point you're like maybe we should just move on from the 90s and 2000s local punk scene well, <laughs> just like let's just like focus on something else. That's I'm like so <laughs> sick of like, like all these like fucking fifty year olds like talking about the twelve inches of their youth. It's just like let's move. Let's talk about something else. Well, uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's a really valid point, and I, I think very that, ironic coming from me. I know, I know, but, like because we've dedicated how many hours of our life to talking about a band that put out songs in the nineties and two thousands, but you know i think there's like a there is legitimately a, a fine line between the importance of documenting things like the importance in saying like this happened and it mattered and here are the people involved and here's what it meant to them and and here's how it continues to sort of have have a a ripple effect on the music that is coming out not only of the city, but then subsequently, you know, coming out of, you know, scenes around the world. And I think that's really interesting. And, you know, like it's, it's important, you know, punk, like sort of a lot of maybe relatively newer genres, um, like hip hop's the same way is it's like very important to kind of understand your history and where this thing comes from. And it's why people get so mad when like, you know, like some 20 year old rapper says that Biggie sucks or like a punk band. Yeah, but that's also why it rules when they do that. No, totally. Because it's like those things actually in reality don't matter, but they're it's just, I, I, yeah, but I they're just still feel like interesting. The, the template for all contemporary music seems to be built around everything that happened in the 90s. And at some point we have to be like, well, who gives a shit? Let's talk about the internet instead or whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know? Like even – because this documentary seems to be built around this notion that San Diego was the next Seattle. But in 2018, thinking about something being the next Seattle is already so like far removed from what life is like now. <laughs> like Seattle doesn't – there's no such thing as a Seattle now because it's all online. So who cares? And there's, there was there's no – and there was never a next Seattle. Like there are a lot of cities that were supposed to be the next Seattle. And that's what's so interesting about continuing to use it as a descriptor because it was like Halifax, the next Seattle, San Diego, the next Seattle. I, I never remembered them talking about San Diego being the next Seattle because I don't know that Antioch Arrow and No Knife had the potential audience of like Soundgarden and Nirvana. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately what it was was just people were using the – utilities that they had to build their own small music scenes and it was really exciting and people were just like oh this is happening everywhere all of these cities are the next seattle right oh and a, a music day, scene just like seattle <laughs> the the next seattle was online mm, are they gonna be like the next seattle was inside us all along well but, it's almost like seattle is its own character <laughs> oh that's it that's interesting <laughs> um no but i did want to this is kind of way off topic, but it also not because it's about San Diego. Um, but <laughs> how does it take it as that long to start pronouncing <laughs> it like that? <laughs> I was looking for more clips with Tom, but I didn't find that. But I did find this PB- KPBS News interview, which is just so surreal. So it's the filmmaker, <laughs> and it's Rob Crow from Pinback, yeah. and then it's the lo- local anchor Peggy Pico talking about like the screamo scene on the news. <laughs> so I'll just play a bit of this. 
In the new movie called It's Gonna Blow, you see and hear a slice of local indie music from the late 80s and early 90s. But San Diego's promising indie music explosion fizzled. Here with some possible reasons why are my guest, San Diego musician Rob Crow with the band Pinback and filmmaker Bill Perrine. And Bill, the title of this film, It's Gonna Blow, is provocative. Uh, what does it mean? It means a few things. Um, it comes from a, a, a line in a song called Aroma of Gina Arnold by a band called Truman's Water. And it's about the idea, uh, it's your plastic culture sucks and it's going to blow. It's about the idea of blowing up the old order and starting anew with something different, something fresh. Um, so that's the first meaning. But it also, it's referring to you know the idea that in the early 90s, people were saying San Diego was going to be the next Seattle, like the next alternative hotspot and the town was going to blow up and become huge. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of that meaning as well. All right, and we're going to come back to that, but first I want to get to a clip from your film where uh, Mitch Wilson of the band No Knife uh, talks about music in San Diego in the 80s and 90s. Think of San Diego, they think of sunshine and, you know, beaches, whatever. I don't know what they think of. San Diego is very, very different for me. I think of, like, all the punk rock kids and all these, you know, all these dark, weird bands and music. <laughs> Now, Rob, uh, how would you describe San Diego's music scene uh, during the early 90s? Well, at its best, I would say it's like a, like a very group of weirdos trying to <laughs> do their best to make the most creative and individualist music that they could, you know. <laughs> well, people think the word weirdos is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. You know, I yeah, I mean, I struggle with this stuff, and I think it's... We talked about this before. This is not. There's, ah, fuck. There's no way for me to kind of get around, sort of sounding like I'm trying to make a joke or, or big up myself. But like, you know, having like written a book about like a, a oh, musical. Oh, here we go. I, yeah, he's okay. gonna start reading off the fucking ISBN number again. <laughs> so, like, that was very much uh, about stuff that happened thirty fucking years ago, and it was interesting to talk to people who alternately. Uh, what I discovered through that, and it actually, you know, at the time that I did it, I felt like it was just like really illuminating and actually kind of useful on a personal level because there were effectively kind of three types of people that you talked to. There were people who they actually didn't want to talk because they were like, I'm I'm over it. I don't want to talk about something that happened 30 years ago. Like it was a fun thing we do when we were kids, but like I'm I'm really fucking good and I don't want to talk to you about like – the the cock ups, my like dumb, you know, power pop band from nineteen seventy eight. And then there were people who were so steeped in nostalgia for that moment. Like, you know, they their their own personal Facebook pages are like just dedicated to constantly sharing like in a in a cycle the same thirty photos of them from when they were <laughs> twenty. <laughs> and they and they live so 100% in that moment. And in some cases, it was like one summer. Like, that's what's so fucked up, especially about punk, right, is it can be that that quick. And yeah. so – and that's the really poisonous side of it that you see in this. And then there are people that I think had like a really – like, they had had full lives. They were really proud of what they had done. Um, it's like a really great story for them, but it's like a part of their experience – and and the grudges that go along with that was really interesting. And so, like, one of the things I found, and this song also evokes this for me, which is why I think it's really interesting, is, like, I was interviewing people who were in their 50s and 60s about stuff they did in their 20s, and a lot of them were really fucking mad at someone that they hadn't talked to in 30 years because of something that when they tried to explain it to you was so asinine. Like, you're like, <laughs> you, are, you stopped talking to your best friend when you were 22 because of this fucking thing, and you're still mad about it at 50? Like, that's so much anger to carry, yeah. to carry with you. And it, it made me, like, because I'm, like, a, you know, quietly quite a hateful person, and, <laughs> and uh, it, it, uh, it's not like a, that has changed in any meaningful way, but it made me really try to like let go of grudges that I had. And it's not like I like reached out to people. Like I didn't go that far and be like, I'm really sorry. I was a dick or whatever, but it made me be like, I can't be mad about that stuff. And, and, and I actually have managed to like, you know, in a lot of ways succeed and in a lot of ways sort of fail in that. But it, it does tie back to what I think the song illustrates so effectively is like this kind of nostalgia illustrated by this. And, and that way of like, do you hold grudges? Do other people hold grudges against you? And how do you process that as like a fucking adult that has moved beyond this moment? Right. Definitely. And it's super interesting. And I think like, 
I think in general, maybe that's why I just love subcultures and I've sort of moved, I've realized that this fascination with, say, the punk scene is actually applicable to basically every subculture. Even lately, like how I'm always interviewing meme people on the pod. Yeah. I think the meme subculture is really interesting because they all hate each other. They all have like secret grudges and secret beefs and there's like notes being screenshotted on the Instagram story. Like it's just like any other subculture. But the thing is like the thing where I get annoyed is when people think that and I think this too and I'm wrong and that's also why I don't like nostalgia. But like people think that their one experience was the only one. They're the only ones who were a bunch of weirdos who were just pulling it all together and struggling to make it through. And it's like, no, that literally happened every single place in the Western world. Yeah. Like, and it's still happening. Like being like, you know, and it's different now. It's all on the internet. It's like, it's not like there's a lot, either it's happening online, which is super fucking interesting, or it's still ha- like, it's the same thing that just repeats. This is just what kids do. Like it's not, yeah. it's not unique to your experience. The output might've been unique. You know, there aren't a lot of bands that sounded like Devo when Devo came out. That was like a moment in Akron. Right. But you know, well, I also feel like the- I mean, and that's the other confusing thing is, like, I always rag on all ages shows in 2018 because I feel like they're not the same as they were in the late 90s. Maybe I'm just wrong, but it does feel like these things change, but then we still sort of hold on to the wrong aspects or we're still, like, putting out split seven inches and shit. And it's like, that that's not a thing that, like... That's they feel it's starting to feel like Funko Pops in the same way, <laughs> you know. It's like so you love them, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but it's just like this people are obsessed with these tangible media things that have this emotional attachment to a time in their life that, like, I don't know. I just, I, I just kind of reject it personally in a way, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a fine line, and you have to be careful not to kind of lose yourself in it. But we're sort of getting away from, I I think, an interesting point that you were starting to make with this documentary, which is like Blink's place in San Diego. And and obviously that sort of affects the song and it sort of ties into these larger emotional themes that are clearly quite resonant for both of us. But it's so funny to think that John Feldman is like, Blink's the only band ever from Seattle. When you're like, here are a a list of (laughs) not just like cool bands that you and I like, but like legendary and important bands. Well, like I wish with, I could have lasting actually, impact. I wish I could have watched the documentary before, like, instead that, of just discovering it 10 minutes before we started recording. Right. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious because maybe Blink was the one that put San Diego. But I just can't imagine, like, Blink-182 gets famous and then all these record label guys are like, I'm going to go talk to Swing Kids in Antioch Air. Like, yeah. I, it, I feel more like probably Blink had to be in, just had to be included in the documentary because they happened to get the most famous. I, yeah, it feels like they are like completely sort of separate like, from that Do you think Tom scene? DeLonge has ever crossed paths with Justin Pearson? Maybe they've like accidentally like been beside each other at a red light or something. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they've ever like talked? <laughs> I, I find it hard to imagine. I don't know how big of a city San Diego is. Have you ever been to San Diego? I have, but um, I'm trying to think. Like, I don't really remember. I think I just went, I was, like, in Tijuana, and I just went to, like, part of San Diego. Just to kind of, like, say you did it? Yeah, like, I, I haven't really, like, spent much time. Other than via uh, Bill Billingsley's excellent guide <laughs> video, which you can find on patreon.com slash blink155. That's right. His excellent tour of San Diego, which is insanely good and was <laughs> stolen, right? Didn't what's, what was the deal there? What happened? It like, re, yeah, it was reposted on like Russian Facebook or something. So, so the video is paywalled. Like the video is a Patreon exclusive. And this, I don't, look, I don't want to, I don't want to know and you, but, um, they did actually just repost. They did actually just steal our like preview post. Okay, because I, I really <laughs> like to imagine that there's like a Russian operative inside <laughs> the nation bot. leaking all of the uh, exclusive Patreon a content. Russian Bernie bro, <laughs> yeah, doing it. exactly <laughs> doing it for the cause. So I respect <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of San Diego. <laughs> Which um, we are definitely speaking of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so of all these things we just talked about, the funniest thing is what is Tom's involvement with San Diego now, which is uh, the most recent thing I found was this questionnaire that he answered for visitcalifornia.com <laughs> <laughs> for a little tourism thing. They should just play yeah. Golden Showers in the Golden State. That's like a... <laughs> 
That's a tourist <laughs> anthem. Do you think, like, first of all, do you think he actually wrote this? And second of all, do you think, do they pay people to do this shit? Because, like, like, Tom DeLonge refuses to r- respond to our emails to come on the pod. <laughs> but he's going to do this shit? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, they, the, uh, tourism, tourism boards have shit tons of, of money. So, like, they would have just been like, yo, we'll give you, I don't know how much money. I don't even know what's a lot of money. Fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a post for exclaim. It's uh, <laughs> he's getting like freelance and all that. That's <laughs> high for exclaim. Yeah, and they he's don't and they don't pay him either. You have to like follow he's up like, and follow, follow up, up and, and he follow starts up. doing those like uh, self important tweets like freelance ain't free. <laughs> <laughs> we need a freelancer uh, tourism board union. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who's gonna stick up for Tom? <laughs> I would love to know how much he got paid to do this. Well, I mean, if we ever get him on the pod, mark that down as one of the things <laughs> we need to ask him. Tough question. So, what, uh, to begin <laughs> with, tell us no, about the freelance the rates. Question. <laughs> so, <laughs> he gets, in case he gets mad, yeah, that's be the last one. Uh, that's true. Yeah, you don't want him hanging up on you because you're demanding to know rates for tourism. And also, like, blocks. does this make you want to go to San Diego? I don't know. Well, I haven't Where fucking read it yet, man. Where do you live? Near the beach in San Diego. I love the energy. Why there? My company to the stars is there. My kids' schools are there. And the sunset is there, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think Ooh. he knows that the sunset's <laughs> everywhere? It might be a bit of a joke. He's a good freelancer. Mm. I wouldn't mind hiring. Maybe he could write a music video premiere for me or something. Well, maybe that's the problem is you're hitting him up asking him to give you stuff. Whereas I think if you hit him up and you said, hey, I'm always looking for new contributors. You know, I know you have <laughs> yeah. a passion for sort of space and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, time travel. There's a lot of content that could be produced there. I can't, I feel like we've said this before, but I, I still don't really get when people love the sunset that much. Like, uh, it's cool. The sunset's nice, but, like, you really care about it every fucking day? I, you know, the sunset's tight. I'm not here to defend the sunset, man. I'm going to go ahead and say fuck the sunset. <laughs> wow, this is going to be the next <laughs> thing that divides the nation. <laughs> My greatest love for California is the diversity of climate and topography. Trees on one end, deserts on the other, and a beach that stretches along both. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is the guy who's uh, talking shit alongside Antioch Arrow. In this <laughs> I just love topography. What is the biggest misperception? Is that a word? Do they mean <laughs> misconception? Yeah, I've never. Hold on. Misperception. Uh, I guess it is. Oh, Wow. A false and inaccurate perception. I mean, it makes sense. It just, I've never heard anyone use it. (laughs) I also feel like tourism board writers are like among the worst writers. (laughs) No offense if you work for a tourism board, but like, yeah, don't don't disrespect the tourism board listeners that we have. (laughs) They might be the ones to fly us out to California. So, (laughs) yeah, that's true. What is the biggest misperception about Californians? Californians. That we all use words like rad and gnarly. That is Southern California only. It's ours. No one else can have it. I feel like Bill would agree with this. Yeah, that's yeah. we should get Bill to answer all of these questions for the uh, Visit Why California. Why Bill on VisitCalifornia.com? <laughs> yeah. he's, he's almost up. Like, he's almost at 333 followers, right? Like, it's happening for Bill. Anyways, this is like the worst fucking interview. And then he talks about how... Anything is possible from arts to technology. You can build a new way of expressing yourself in your mind and build a better life in California. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, this is bad. And then he talks about how he likes Mexican food. He likes Joshua Tree National Park. And his best California song is California Girls by the Beach Boys. Like, this is the most basic thing I've ever read. (laughs) Maybe this was an intern. Yeah, I think it might have been an intern. And then, oh, yeah, how would your dream California day unfold? Wake up in the mountains and get a warm coffee, which already bothers me so much. Like, <laughs> Why don't you want a hot, hot coffee? coffee? Yeah. <laughs> He's not the lukewarm coffee. I want it That's to be cold worst. quickly. <laughs> well, get a cold brew then, Tom. <laughs> no, he wants a warm brew. <laughs> drive two hours to the desert and take a hike, then drive two more hours to the coast and the beaches in San Diego's North County to watch the sunset ignite into a flurry of colors. And with a Mexican beer in hand. That does sound good, Tom. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm ready to visit California.com. Yeah, for some of that signature San Diego warm coffee. <laughs> That's what they're known for. 
Now, I do have a question for you about this song, uh-huh. San Diego by Blink-182. Yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of what ifs. And I was wondering, what if the song had a guitar solo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been wondering that as well. So I'm glad that uh, you and I are on the same page in terms of, uh, in, in terms of our sort of queries. <laughs> well, luckily, Little Red Guitars, he... Man, this guy has so many accounts. I think it's because everyone hates him. No offense. I mean, I don't necessarily <laughs> no hate offense. him, but he like he's had little red guitars one, little red guitars two. This one is almost the sex number because it's little red guitar sixty nine. Oh, just one um, off. Yeah, it's just one off from the sex number. <laughs> um, so uh, here's and uh, but luckily with even with this account, uh, comments are disabled. <laughs> I wonder why. Why, man. Like, do you ever think if if you have to do something if you do something where you just always have to make sure the comments are disabled? Do you think maybe like maybe sometimes I know comments are bad. Don't read the comments. Everything like that. But maybe sometimes comments do serve a slight corrective in life. Yeah, I mean, like, I th- I can <laughs> understand, and I think it's very depressing when like you know like feminist frequency. It's a great YouTube channel. It's like sort of feminist theory applied to video game analysis. It's super interesting. I don't even like video games that much. They always have to disable the comments. And you because, don't like feminists. And, yeah, exactly. There's two strikes, but somehow I enjoy this channel. <laughs> and the comments are always disabled because it's just like hate speech, like unstoppable hate speech and death threats. But like this yeah. is just like a bald white guy playing guitar. Like you can take so it. Man. You're saying if there was a place where hate speech and death threats belong. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this video will prove you correct. <laughs> very best part of the song. I know. And it, it is great for its simplicity. I mean, um, yeah, and, and I think what he's done is elevated it by providing it with the, uh, <laughs> by, the punch. Uh, just n- noodling on a major scale That's and then it. doing some wanky speed runs at the end. I love to wank on my major yeah. noodle. It doesn't work, yeah, but it's pretty good. It's fine. You know, that does fit into the next thing I wanted to show you, which is purely visual again. <laughs> um, but something that often comes up is people do, like, class projects where they make a new music video for a song. Yeah. Or in this case, one of the only the only music videos are fan-made. And, and so this one was uploaded by Bryant Doherty. I think everyone is very uh, Irish this week. It must be Irish week. <laughs> <laughs> it's I uh, like they do. It's not Irish season. It's, they only get a week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I I did that on purpose because there's no fucking way. You don't want to embrace um, the Irish that much. No, but also I've never seen someone with the first name Bryant, and that's quite frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you found something new to be mad about. <laughs> Is that? Have you ever seen that Bryant? Like, how do you even say that? Oh, hey, Bryant. It's almost three syllables because you have to work to get that T in there. Bryant. Yeah, and it really is. It's two and a half syllables for sure. That's very, very aggravating. But yeah, Bryant Doer T is just like too many T's, man. Yeah, just come on. You can do do better. Do better, Bryant. <laughs> so Bryant and his friends are just uh, hanging out in San Diego. Uh, they're drinking at the beach. They're doing various things. It's like not that great. But then I really did love at the 130 mark of this video, um, one of them draws a really cool dick. <laughs> oh, that's a really cool dick. So it's like it almost looks like a Rocco's Modern Life character to me. Yeah, but um, but a veiny dick. Yeah, so it's like a veiny dick wearing glasses with a backwards hat, and I think he's drinking some sort of bevy. And he's just like a ch- oh oh he was drawing his friend but it was, ended up being a dick I see uh, oh, that's funny it looks like it looks a bit like if Poochie were a dick yeah yeah so I don't know I mean I like dicks yeah I like Poochie so 
It's all of our interests converging. You know, I don't think anyone really did like Poochie. That was kind of the point of the episode. I didn't but understand that. I guess you're, you're, because you're like a marketing guy. You, <laughs> yeah, you, I'm you like, empathize with right. the people who created them. <laughs> <Yeah. him. laughs> ticked all the boxes. I was like, they've done the focus groups. They know that people need Poochie. <laughs> it's correct. Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't understand um, the conflict in that episode. Well, Sam, would you like to talk about covers of the song, or would you like to uh, go on with our night? <laughs> I just, just forget about yeah. forget this ever happened. I just want to relax. No, I would like to t- do some covers. What if we just stopped doing covers? What would happen? I think the world would keep spinning, man. Yeah, so let's let's do a poll right now. So we're gonna. Uh, do you guys want us to do covers or not? And then we'll just wait here until you answer. <laughs> okay. Cool. I haven't heard anything yet. I'm not. I'm not getting any feedback now. So we could just not do them. Yeah, let's just not. <laughs> I, I, you must have found some weird shit though with this, right? Honestly, n- no. Like, it's a bit disappointing. I, I, I think say, it's because the, the covers is all so... suck. We don't have to do covers. No, I mean, obviously we're gonna fucking do well, covers. I don't know. But Maybe they're, they're not. They're, they're just like it is. Just kind of disappointing. It's a lot of like very earnest acoustic guitars mm-hmm. and. A lot of very earnest other like it's just I don't know. I mean we'll power through them, but it's not gonna necessarily be an all time or cover sesh if that's okay. what you're wanting. <laughs> I mean, no, Can't I don't be... want all time. I just don't want to like waste my life here. Well, that's not an option. <laughs> yes, to I, not do. I sort of already I, <laughs> that that's a long sort of foregone conclusion for me, I guess. But it's just such a like I don't even know what order to do them. I like I guess I'll just power through them. So here's a piano. Okay. I mean, what do you want? It's a piano. It's a fucking piano. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is uploaded by sincerely Andrew, um, and this to me looks like it's happening in like a lecture hall, maybe. Yeah. Or? This definitely looks like a school like practice room or something. Yeah. Um, oh, and I guess. Oh, there is a violin later on. I didn't see that, so I'll skip ahead to the violin. So he, you know, and. Mark Hoppus does this too. How do you feel about referring to your significant other as the plus one? I think that's weird because it implies that you're always the one on the guest list. Yeah, and I mean, that is usually true. I mean, guest lists are very sexist in that way, actually. Right. <laughs> like, anytime a friend has put us on the guest list, they've never put Sarah Hughes <laughs> plus one, literally ever. You should so. start insisting that they do. That can be sort of your contribution, your way of sort of disrupting <laughs> the patriarchy. <laughs> it's like, uh, I believe it's under Sarah plus one. Thank you. <laughs> Just arguing with a door person. <laughs> They're like, I don't know, man, I've got you on the list. And you're like, no, 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 you no, don't. No, no, no. Print it out again, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so the, um, Sincerely Andrews plus one. Uh, sincerely, I don't know, trying to do a joke. It's got nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there is some violin in here as well. So let's give it a listen. <laughs> I kind of liked it, and then I didn't. This, you know, I really hated it before the plus one came in. Yeah, um, literally, don't know her name because he didn't put it there. So that's it. He's reduced her <laughs> to simply a number and a symbol. Unless her name actually is plus one, in which case I apologize to you. Right? Oh, that would, that's the sort plus of plus one. <laughs> the sort of <laughs> assumption that I would make, like I'd be like, "This is fucking ridiculous." <laughs> But I make it like really political and try to make it seem like I was on the right side, and then I would be schooled. Dust off the soapbox. Yeah, exactly. I'm here to set things right. I mean, that's going to be the pattern. Is that ultimately the? It's just the song is so fucking earnest that it's 
it never goes well, unfortunately. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so excited. Yeah. So uh, similarly, the other piano one that I wrote down is uh, uploaded by Ballad of Bad Wolf. I like that. Uh, look at this guy's picture. Um, there's like a, a punk in a suit. He's got a mohawk, but he's in a suit. But it's all torn he's got up. A fedora beside him. <laughs> it's all torn up. And then on the wall, there's like a whole bunch of album covers. Like there's Lagwagon. Nirvana, Goldfinger, So Long Thanks for the Shoes, The Used, In Flames, Protest the Hero. I mean, this guy's a true cut-from-the-cloth fucking punker yeah. in a suit. Oh, that's so wild. <laughs> so here's a description. A couple of years ago, I used to make piano covers of metal and punk songs just for fun so that I'd have something to do on a weekend. I haven't done one in a long time, but this weekend I did one with Blink-182's San Diego off their new album, California. I grew up in San Diego. It's a city that I'll always feel pulled towards. So this is the Ballad of Bad Wolves. Okay. fucking terrible <laughs> <Jeez. So. laughs> why'd you do that man i liked it <laughs> I, w- I do wish that it, it like it could have been sort of like a it his voice almost sounded like marilyn manson like he should have gotten rid of the mohawk cartoon and instead made it goth and then if i was like oh if i make fun of this this guy's gonna shoot up my school then i would have liked it <laughs> okay yeah but instead you're just like this person likes Operation Ivy, so you're not as concerned about <laughs> yeah, violence. Exactly, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that uh, yeah, that was bad. That's making I'm. Oh, I, how many of these are you going to play? I don't know how many should I do. I got a few more. Maybe one I'll keep more. <laughs> no, I'm going to do because they're d- a couple. I got a couple. Okay. I got a couple. Okay, uh, they're not. <laughs> I mean, this one is quite awful oh as well. Um, I don't. What is it about the songs that are like good? Yeah, like song. Some songs are perfectly rendered by Blink One Eight Two and should stand as the only version. And then other songs do lend themselves to like a reinterpretation. It's you know because I feel like with this one, it's so. It's so obvious. This is what we said before. I'm just I'm literally repeating myself. It's so obvious that it has like genuine emotional resonance for them at a time when it feels like they're sort of pumping out songs that maybe lack that or are much more sort of like surface. And I think other people interpreting that just sort of feels kind of a little hollow because you're like, I actually really know what this song is kind of about. And so you're like faking that emotion. Because, you, you know, like even though we, we obviously relate to it, we've talked a lot about the million ways that we relate to it. I think there's just something about it that like renders it sort of like their version is the right version. I think it's also that uh, on a lot of their new songs with Feldy, the melodies are so either overthought or just like pandering to be catchy that they do sound like kind of Disney Channel sort of songs or like musical theater. And I think this one still has that a little bit where – when you strip away the pop punk elements, you're like, oh, this is the melody itself feels corny. Yeah, it's just like it reminds you that there's stuff about the song that is bad. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's still not like a classic sick blink song. It's very much like a big corny pop song. And this is a reminder of that where like I was a little surprised how much you liked it because I do feel like this is 
a hugely corny song. Yeah. Like, this is a sure. song that, like, if I put on, like, for sure, <laughs> Ashley would make fun of me for. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, like, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you – and so I think it's that. It's, like, if it's something that, like, this – like, a – could be made fun of in a way that you would have trouble defending it. Um, it's going to be hard to cover. Yeah. So let's, but maybe, maybe, uh, the singer, uh, Z I E K I Z Z Y, uh, Zai Kizzy and his accompaniment, uh, lousy with a capital Z hero. Maybe they could do a tasteful cover of the song. Okay, Perhaps. well, can't wait to find out. And and I would just like to add that both of them are doing that thing uh, where the microphone is dangling upside down and you, like, hold it. You know, I get that. Like, it's, like, dangling like a, like a fucking ball sack. It just, well, it makes me think of the Gone Away video, right? The Offspring song. That, that's, there's a lot of, there's, like, lights swinging and the mic swinging. It's great. I don't know. I, th- I think that there must be a more, like, emo... Uh, stand in for that because I do feel like it's also like an emo guy thing or maybe it's even is it an Alexis on fire thing to have the dangling tea bag microphone <laughs> I don't know that like well have, I'll check in with George and find out like if he <laughs> if he does if the, he likes to be tea bagged by the mic if he likes to be mic bagged <laughs> but I can't I can't picture it but maybe I don't know I mean there's something more emo than pop punk about Zai Kizzy and lousy heroes yeah uh, no th- I don't think these guys dangle. are referencing the the offspring um, uh, <laughs> hold on I'm just I'm just looking at some Alexis videos right now the mics all look to be either on a on a stand or in his hand so okay well that's good he didn't so he's not a he's not a, that kind of uh, <laughs> he's he's not I'm a, just gonna hit play on the fucking video. <laughs> It's just like a huge alt rock song too. The way that it goes halftime is very third eye blind to me. Yeah, totally. And a, a sick band, but that voice that bleh, like doing that thing when your voice isn't organically breaking is like the worst thing that emo did. Yeah, but I, I just like the it. I think the other thing is like it's so earnest that you realize Blink One Eight Two were really being tasteful with what they did because there is so much room to be corny as fuck with this song. Yeah, totally. That was bad. I just want to say, yeah, when it comes to mics, it's either on a stand or keep it in your hand. Yeah, that's the rule of thumb. Don't do the don't do the uh, tea bag. That's for ball sacks only. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> keep it in the bag. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I feel like we're both a little on edge here. <laughs> right now. And so I'm going to just end with like something a little bit more comfortable. Okay, something great. Something a little bit more comforting. Because we've, I don't know if we've ever really gone down this route before, but there is thankfully a lullaby version of the song. Oh. We can just like calm down a little bit. That's with. good. Because, yeah, like we're both, we both have colds. Like, you know, it's just. Yeah, and we're getting aggravated by all these <laughs> scrotum mic dangles. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, so, okay, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for this. So this was uploaded only earlier this month by Sparrow Sleeps, um, and it's a cover of San Diego.
Oh yeah, that's so much better. Isn't that nice? Uh, I'm. I'm just, Do you feel relaxed? I feel so good. So, <laughs> doesn't that sound like? Something that would score like the teaser trailer for a horror movie where there's no, there's no, (laughs) there's no, um, dialogue clips. It's just Mm. all like sort of ethereal haunting visuals. Or it's like dystopian. Yeah. Very children of men. Yeah. 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 Totally. Um, so that actually comes from an entire lullaby tribute to California called Cala Snoria. Yeah. I was noticing the artwork was really not relaxing me because it looks like <laughs> a, a dead, dead child. child <laughs> yeah, on there. <laughs> I I also suspect that this person is from Toronto because Sparrow Sleeps has entire tribute albums. So Calisnoria, according to Apple Music, is their most popular. They also have Half Hour of Power Nap, a tribute to Sum Forty One's Half Hour of Power. Um, there's uh, like a full tribute to the uh, self-titled Newfound Glory album. There's a f- Wait, why does that make them from Toronto? Because in addition to that, there's an entire album uh, dedicated to bands on Dine Alone Records. It's called Dine Alone Lullabies, and it has Alexis on Fire lullabies and Arkell's lullabies. Wow, this Attacking Black lullabies. Uh, Joyce Manor too. This is awesome. Yeah, they have an entire uh, entire tribute to uh, of all these things. I will grow tired or whatever the fuck that albums. They have an entire tribute to like the first city in color record. Like, oh, and their tribute. This is good. Their lullaby tribute to commit this to memory. The um, uh, oh my god, Motion City soundtrack album is called Commit This to Mammary. Which like that's good. So this person <laughs> well, uh, might we maybe we should have them on the pod because I like the fact. I that mean, I just want to because there's a lot of people who listen who aren't Canadian. I just and Sam, just please let me speak to the audience directly right now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I just want to point out that um, perhaps you've experienced this in your own country with a different city, but people who live in Toronto generally do feel that Toronto, Bloor Street, whatever, is the only thing that exists in the world while they're there it's like the it's like this black hole where all everything just revolves around toronto so if anything seems like it references toronto they think that it's definitely because it's from toronto um and so now that i'm done addressing the audience i just want to say i looked at the about page and the location is the united states oh (laughs) unlikely because you just want i just thought everyone was from here so bad Oh, that's so fucked up. So, uh, Josiah, what are your final thoughts on the song Toronto by Blink-182? Oh, no, there's, ten, there's ten more covers, dude. <laughs> no, you said this was the last one and you were going to chill us uh, out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm starting to see I'm starting to see some cracks in it from the covers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad we stopped it before the rest of the trash that you had. Yeah, like it's really good, but I do think like nostalgia itself – I don't really think this song has the staying power. Like, I don't really get how you listen to it that many times. I think it's powerful and good, but I also feel like I could happily not listen to it again because I don't think that it's giving me more each time. It's just sort of giving me an emotional high that's less and less each time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair assessment because I know I played the shit out of it and I don't, like, go back to it. And I don't really go back to California in general, but this isn't like a song that's on a lot of playlists, you know, it's just sort of my, my measure of things. And even after this, this, I'm not going to like put it on. Like, I don't really feel like I need to hear it again. And that's probably partially because I played it 133 times within three days of it coming out. Um, but I think, yeah, like it's, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's the best case scenario for late era blink and I love it, but yeah, it, it it may be like we've exposed some some fissures that I mostly through these covers that I don't I don't I don't want to think too much about. Right. But we do have a guest, right? Yeah. So um, this is I'm actually really excited. about this. So Switch on Pop is uh, an amazing podcast, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that sort of does this like in-depth look uh, at individual songs. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll do a few songs an episode or they'll just tackle like humble or, or whatever. Um, really like interesting guys, really sort of smart, uh, deconstructions of songs. So if you're into like song exploder, um, this podcast, the alkaline (laughs) trio podcast, um, it's in that Mm -hmm. vein. And this was like actually a really amazing conversation because I mean, I never 
thought that Blink-155 was going to be like one of those pods, but it was like really fun to have a conversation with someone who like immediately wanted to go like very deep on like we get like there's art theory in this guest episode. Like it gets very real. Like he had notes um, but it's also interesting because I think sounds a little familiar that someone you would talk to would have. <laughs> well, here's what's <laughs> here's what's great about it because mostly in my experience with the pod, um, you know, there's there's two guys with their pod. There's two guys, and one of them seems to do a lot of the like kind of setting up, and then Charlie, who who is our guest this week, does sort of a lot of responding and sort of brings his own kind of background to things. But on some level, I was like, I kind of felt like maybe he was the me of their pod. But then even in our guest spot, he came with like notes and notes and notes. So <laughs> in this interview, it's like if I really did my job, that's sort of what's happening. And so it's it's a really exciting and I think like extremely illuminating conversation that if you came to this podcast 68 weeks ago looking for an intelligent the sex number <laughs> yeah and you, so not you you made it so congrats to you and uh, <laughs> if if you were looking for like a really um you know, uh, deeply uh, researched and well thought out dissection of the song San Diego and you didn't get that over the last 2 hours here it is well it sounds like it's going to be colon good Charlie Hardy from Switched On Pop, thank you so much for uh, joining us on a podcast that is just like yours, but incredibly dumb. It's a pleasure. <laughs> it's a pleasure <laughs> to have you here, man. Thank you. No, I think what you're doing is a beautiful thing. It's what podcasting is for, to get very deep into something <laughs> that uh, previously didn't have a home, and now it has a home. It is. It's shocking how deep you can go on like a 30 second Blink-182 song, let alone a song with some substance like this one that we're talking about this week. It contains the whole multiverse within it. Yeah, I sometimes wonder how, because you guys are often doing uh, on your podcast, like really like deep, meaningful songs. And we're doing like Fuck a Dog, which is a, a <laughs> Blink-182 song. And we'll talk for like two hours about Fuck a Dog. And so when you are talking about, you know, Humble for a, for a, a contracted period of time, I'm just like yeah. astounded by your focus, honestly. Thanks, man. Yeah, well, our job is to unwind all the meaning and all the things and help people listen more deeply to music. You know, so Switched On Pop is really all about breaking things down to their component parts and particularly focused on what does the music have to say. So I'm excited to bring that angle to looking at San Diego. Yeah. And this is, again, I was mentioning this to you before we started recording, effectively the promise of this podcast that we have never realized for other people. So very excited to have actual insight uh, for the first time <laughs> in 68 episodes on this podcast. So uh, I, I wanted to start off with your relationship to Blink-182. Uh, what was your sort of first exposure to this band? Uh, were you a, a fan back in the day? Where do they sit in, in your heart and in your record collection? I'm the worst music journalist to have on your show because <laughs> I had no relationship to Blink-182 when I was younger. I missed the entire wave of 90s pop music when I was of age to be listening to it. Uh, I grew up in it, but I think due to feeling socially rejected in middle school, I also rejected the music of middle school. This is not an uncommon thing. And so I looked to music of the past. And for a long time, I was very snobbish about all things. And But in other ways, I think I'm the best music journalist to bring on the show toot my own horn because <laughs> my job is really to look at what the music has to say independent mm -hmm. of my own sense of taste and values and what I grew up with but yeah unfortunately I, I, I missed the band my brother listened to them I was very upset about it I, uh, <laughs> in, I intercepted and I gave him like I was like you have to listen to real music you know, they gave me like the Beach Boys and the Beatles and I was like that's real music and which is uh, that was a, a, a really a, a upsetting period that I don't I don't look fondly upon. But that's definitely a certain type of teenager. That's so like totally. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. music hasn't been the same since they switched from analog oh, to digital, oh, right? Yeah, it's the, uh, so obnoxious. And so that was you. I was as so a teenager. Obnoxious. Yes, I yeah. was. I was that obnoxious teenager. <laughs> but my, my relationship has evolved, though. Um, uh, in in preparing in preparing for this episode, I was like, I got to go back and listen to a bunch of tracks and for not having been a fan, it was outstanding 
how many lyrics and melodies were just ingrained in my brain. Right. And I think that that speaks to the power of the band. They can make melodies that stick with you. They have lyrics which are unforgettable, whether profane or profound, and they uh, have so much energy. It's undeniable. So I was very pleased to go. I'm very pleased to go down this rabbit hole with you. This is very exciting. And also interesting to me because something that Josiah and I talk about a lot is how we would feel about a lot of this music without the context of having fallen in love with it when we were in grade eight or grade nine, because to us, it's like imprinted on our lives. And we're like, this is fucking genius. And then you (laughs) kind of have to wonder if you were a more cynical uh, adult going back and listening to some of these songs, how would you feel about them? But you're, you're sort of bringing not necessarily the cynicism of your adulthood, but the sort of open-mindedness of of the process that you've developed. And and you're finding a lot here. I hope that as we age, we can open our minds and not close them off. I don't think that it tends to be the statistical Yeah, I don't trend. think that's what happens. However, it's something that I'm trying to pursue deeply through my very inane project of evaluating pop music <laughs> of the 21st century. That's right. my, my small mission. So it's sort of like working for you on just like a purely psychological, you know, philosophical level of keeping you from closing yourself off to the world. If there's anything that people ought to remember from this show, I have one message, which is that if you don't like something, it probably, it probably means you don't understand it. And it might mean that you actually understand it extremely well and you know all the reasons why it's not working. But if you hear something which is novel or outside of what is your taste and you're like, man, I don't like it. It probably just means you don't understand its language. So my, my approach is, Hey, can I go and, spend some time learning the language of that thing. Mm -hmm. Once I feel like I have some facility with that language, can I then evaluate whether or not the piece is succeeding within what it's trying to do? Like, what is this song trying to say? And is it doing so effectively within its aesthetic? It's not always easy. It takes time. That's why, you know, you have people like me that go make the podcast. You can listen to the podcast instead of having to go do the deep listening. But that's that's the the mission that I'm trying to spread. If you don't know it, go. If you don't like it, you probably means you don't know it. Go learn it before you decide to evaluate it. And if you don't have the time to go learn it, listen to Switched on Pop, and you're kind of offering a, a summary for the people. <laughs> Thank, yeah, thanks for the plug. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's something that we've sort of, especially the deeper we get into this project, really struggled with. And in particular, uh, again, to sort of mention my co-host Josiah, he he often mentions that he has got to a point where he no longer is able to tell the difference between good and bad. Like he used to sure. think Nickelback was obviously shit. And now <laughs> you, you kind of wonder, you're like, wait, are Nickelback actually very good at being Nickelback? I mean, that they're succeeding in that realm. And therefore your sort of personal take of this being good or bad more has to do with the context and the baggage that you bring to any given song or piece of art, right? Way more important than any podcast about music is the book, Let's Talk About Love by Carl Wilson. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't read it, uh, th- and, and if your listeners haven't read it, this is just so pivotal. It is a review of Celine Dion's 1999 album, Let's Talk About Love, which featured My Heart Must Go On. This is the Titanic craze. And it opens up with this just terrible review, a very sort of what you would expect from a snobbish uh, music reviewer mm-hmm. saying, oh, this album is terrible. It's overly sentimental. It's no good. And the second chapter is this question of t- sort of to your Nickelback point. If this thing is so successful, how can it be so successful? And I am so right that it's bad. Like how are both of these things happening at once? The rest of the book is one of the most brilliant um discourses on the way in which our own personal tastes often map onto our own class and how class structures and artistic aesthetics are not inseparable. These are, this, there's no art as universal language outside of our own identities. And by the end of it, you'll come back around and you're never going to hear Celine Dion the same way. <laughs> it is brilliant. Uh, open my ears to everything. It is. It's a fantastic book, and, and the subtitle as well is "A Journey to the End of Taste." Yes, which yes. which I love. It sort of perfectly summarizes it. And in fact, it was originally part for people interested in that book. Which yeah, I, I totally wholeheartedly second your recommendation. 
uh, not only is the original version great, which is part of the 33 and a third series, uh, but there was a expanded version. The expanded version is that's where it's at. And so it comes with a series of essays. I can see. So for people listening to this, and I always complain about this being uh, an audio medium where we constantly use visual references. You and I are speaking on video Skype and we're both pointing at it on our own bookshelves. Like I can see see mine's down here. I'm, it's it's in I, I color code my books because I'm obnoxious. Oh and yeah. it's in the red category. I'm yeah. looking for it. But it's, <laughs> it's the the expanded version has an amazing series of subsequent essays, all sort of uh, traveling down the same uh, uh, interesting philosophical road. So yes, definitely that book is. Carl Wilson is brilliant. I really think that that book has done more for me as a listener and as a music journalist than anything else. Absolutely. You know who else is brilliant? Blink One Eighty Two and yes. their, their brilliant song San Diego. <laughs> So sometimes, again, we have guests on this on this podcast who have not mm-hmm. listened to the song. They're like, I kind of always hated Blink, and then we just talk shit for 15 minutes. <laughs> you uh, went to the trouble of listening to San Diego, and so in, in the broadest terms— It was uh, troubling. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in, in the broadest terms, I would love to know what your initial impression of this song was, especially as yep. someone who didn't necessarily have the background— you have a general sense of who Blink-182 are, but you're not bringing a ton of baggage that someone like myself is bringing to a, to a newer Blink-182 song. Right. So even though I like to uh, toot my own horn and suggest that, well, I am post-taste, I, of course, have my own taste. Mm-hmm. And so my first reaction to this song was, this sounds like rehashed rehearsal of old material. And uh, the word San Diego is as terrible to sing as it is to visit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just, not, no, I don't mean to knock the San Diego. I actually just went there for the first time. I loved it. But it, San Diego, just it's San Diego. It's like, yeah. uh, it's just not a good word. Some um, cities are highly musical. I mean, for example, it's not a city, but like California as a, oh, as an idea beautiful. in American literature and then in music. I mean, there's a, reason why people return to it. It's not just that it's evocative. It sounds so good. But San Diego does not have that draw. Diago. (laughs) It it has the guh. And it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work well. And also I find most uh, city name songs to be like a little pandery. But Mm -hmm. of course this one's earned because they're from San Diego. So that's, that, that was First reaction. Your first reaction was stop trying to make San Diego a (laughs) musical thing, basically. Yeah, don't make it's not going to happen. It's not happening. What was your impression of it sort of versus, you know, I imagine as sort of not a sincere fan, you were probably you knew knew, you knew all the small things. You knew, damn it. Maybe I miss you. Is this what you thought Blink was going to sound like in 2000 and I guess 17 when it came out, 2018 when you're listening to it? Oh, how do I say this? <laughs> it doesn't. So on one hand, I expect bands at this phase of their career, right? They're 25 years in, which is are, amazing. Are you no pausing has, to not talk shit? Because just to be clear, like we are very mean <laughs> about Blink-182 on this podcast. So don't, <laughs> well, they're no, not no, listening, man. It's fine. Okay. So I, I no, I'm trying to figure out how to break this down, but basically like bands been around and so you kind mm-hmm. of expect that they're just like doing the best of tours and playing vegas at this point which are they doing a vegas residency they are literally they are. doing it well they, they had to stop because of travis sparker's uh that's right bl- blood oh, clots yes. and now but he's yeah. good now and they're starting up the residency again okay okay so so they're at that phase of the career so you you kind of expect that there's going to be uh sound the same but probably with more auto-tune and a little more pastiche and yes that's there but I was surprised by how much I spent some time going through the album California as well, just to sort of think like, where does it fit in the rest of their work? And it sounds like it fits in with their early work to me. Like it doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like they have polished things up with modern production techniques because honestly their, their production was already so tight back in the late nineties that I don't know. It, it, it seems to fit in with the rest of their work. It almost sounds like they haven't evolved, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it just sounds like, hey, they're doing their shtick and they do it really well. Yeah, I mean, I think this this record is definitely them. California that it's from is, is certainly them trying to, you know, I think critic on on a critical level do an impression of what they think people like about Blink, which is maybe a negative, but yeah, also yeah. like they know their lane. They know what the kids want. Okay, so this and this is where I was so sort of uh, 
let's talk about second reaction. My, my, my first reaction is like, nah, not for me. It sounds like it's kind of rehashed. And then I spent some time thinking about like, what is this serving? So mm-hmm. it's the same idea of like, what is the languages of the stuff? What's it trying to do? And it was pretty clear to me, like, this is a song for fans. This is a song made for the people that love Blink-182, that know their whole history, that can hear all of the references. And beyond that, I think that they use a brilliant artistic device that once I heard it, I was like, oh, dang. You just made San Diego a good song. <laughs> when what is, is that? What is that device, Charlie? That device is Trump Loy, the French word for deceives the eye, and it's uh, I, I may be taking it from the visual realm into the auditory realm, but basically, Trump Loy is this idea of a frame within a frame or illusions that make two uh, D images feel three dimensional. Okay. And so I, so oftentimes the way you see this as, as a, as an artistic device, you might see it as a literary device in which you might have a book about a writer writing a novel. Like the, the the book, uh, house of leaves is about a, there is a journalist within an academic paper within a compilation of papers with editor's notes and there's layers and layers and layers of writing and what happens is that you forget that you're reading a book and so you see this similarly in, in film with somebody is a filmmaker within the film um right, or like adaptation frame. so yeah, exactly. adaptation is about the process of charlie kaufman trying to adapt a book and it's so or being that, john malkovich right. right and you have the same idea of just like you're you're so deep within the narrative about making the thing making the thing making the thing you forget you're watching the thing it's it's a really great, it's a good device. Because it's just it, like it's Hamlet just, really is the same thing, right? Like the play within the play. Is that sort of still? Absolutely. Right. It's just the yeah, bard. It's, it's a, Love to talk about a, the bard on this podcast. Thank you for bringing Shakespeare into we it. We always is, do. This is exactly the kind of stuff we do on Switched on Pop. <laughs> is just go back as far as we can uh, to, to the logical conclusion. I'm sure we could make it Homeric if we needed to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In, in any case, they are using this same device of Trump Loy to get you so embedded within the song that you kind of forget that you're listening to the song. And the way that I'm hearing that they do this is the song is steeped in musical and lyrical nostalgia. And yet the whole song is lamenting nostalgia. It's a song about nostalgia that hates nostalgia. I don't want to go back to San Diego. Uh, It has all these bad things for me. And yet musically it's hitting all of your pleasure points and references of blank 182 from the verse to the pre-chorus to the chorus to the post-chorus to the outro every single piece of it is like oh i've heard this song this sounds like these other songs that i've already heard and so i think by employing this trump Lloyd device for me the song is actually quite successful that's so interesting wow this is the exact podcast that i was trying to start 68 weeks ago <laughs> do you do you feel like the, the sort of also very specific reference to the cue that is not just like a passing sort of anecdote in the verse, but literally embedded in the chorus is is emblematic of. And again, just so I get it right, yep. is it Trump ploy? Like it's literally like you're <laughs> like a ploy no. by your terrible president sort of thing. Like is that how that's like? What's I'm, the origin of my, that? My my French is terrible, but it's Trump loyal. Loy. Oh, okay, okay. L apostrophe O E I L L E. And so, yeah, would you, would you, how do you feel like that, that sort of particular, uh, the kind of cure piece? I guess that sort of really fits in that pretty neatly then, because it's. Yeah. Exactly. There's like references within references within references. So if you'll allow me, if you want, we can go through, I've sort of mapped out each of these different references. I will allow you. Yes. (laughs) That would be amazing. Okay. So let's start in the verse. The beginning of San Diego, we get actually even sort of before the verse in the introduction, we have these very sort of plunky guitar lines. It has this minor introspective feel. And to me, you know, I only know Blank 182's top 10 songs, but... I mean, they're all I'm hits. So, right. And so like, I'm sure there's like deeper, deeper, deeper references, but this mm-hmm. introspective gu- minor guitar plucky song is like Adam's song. And it's there is some sort of lament, right? He's singing. Sometimes I wonder where our lives go and question who we used to be. Now, Adam's song, of course, is this really tragic song about a uh, suicide note. Luckily the kid's okay in the end of the song. And rather than uh, an Adam song where he's sort of, the character is looking forward and thinking about how they don't want to go on. This is a song in which the character is instead looking back and thinking about how bad things were in the past and how San Diego was, uh, has a sort of mixed emotion uh, for them. And so I think you actually get the same sort of, 
artistic quality and sonic quality from Adam's song right in the beginning of the track. You get a transition, though. There's this line coming out of the verse going into the pre-chorus. In the first verse, he sings, Sometimes I feel like I'm the oxygen between the cigarette and gasoline, which is maybe not the most poetic line, but it is extremely evocative. It Mm -hmm. suggests things are about to fucking explode, right? Like on the oxygen between the cigarette and gasoline, those things, th- those two things match and it's going to go boom. Um, and so you expect it to explode. And I was looking for a reference. And I think um, another great reference point is the song stay together for the kids, which opens with that same sort of like minor pluckiness and then has this really angsty teenager, like this house is broken. I'm so upset. And the whole thing explodes. Yeah. But we don't get that. And the song kind of like flips on us and we're getting this sort of postmodern melange of all the different blank sounds. So we start with the Adam song. We get the expectations. Things are going to blow up, like stay together for the kids. But we move into the pre and I really actually don't like this line, but he says, I can't sleep because what if I dream of going back to San Diego? It's almost like he's like trapped in a nightmare on Elm street or something. And if, yeah. if he falls asleep, he's going to be taken back to San Diego and haunted. Well, it's like, I um, think Tom is basically the Freddy Krueger then of that scenario. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's smart at this moment. Um, he, when, when he sings, what if I dream all of the music drops out and then Travis comes in and goes into the chorus. And yeah, so, very Travis. Yeah. And you think you know, you're going to, you're going to get some sort of monster explosion, but you don't, and you get a whole nother kind of Blink-182. Instead, uh, you get this chorus, which is just a classic, like, catchy pop-punk song that has their, you know, the thing that they do well is this crossover between pain and nostalgia, but buried in an upbeat pop-punk song. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then they're just like, as you pointed out, all these reference points, like, go see The Cure, listen to your favorite songs in the parking lot, and just, like, pleasure points in your brain of all of these these past memories and then think of every person you've lost. And it, it's kind of like this rambling it, rehashing of teenage years. Like you're singing your favorite songs and you're also like, you've lost a friend. And then they sing, can't go back to San Diego, which is so fun because the post chorus, when they're singing, they can't go back to San Diego, which again, I think just, it does not roll off the tongue, <laughs> but they go into this classic breakdown. Everything just like, and it's amazing. And so you've gone from, uh, well, well, and then we have to wrap it up. And the whole song wraps up when you get into the outro. Um, you go back into the sullen riff that you get from the intro. Uh, so it's kind of like you actually haven't had any resolution. You've actually just gone through this like blink one eighty two whirlwind of having experienced Adam songs stay together for the kids. You've have like some, like, I, I don't know if it's like all the small things or some other sort of like catchy chorus. I couldn't find a breakdown. Maybe, you know, a good breakdown, but it was just a classic pop punk breakdown. And then by the end of it, you've just kind of like gone through the whole dream and you're back to where you started. And the guitar line ends on this big open unresolved note. Uh, what an amazing trip we have uh, had. We've lamented the nostalgia for San Diego, and yet we have uh, relived our nostalgic dreams of every Blink-182 hit all baked together in one song. (laughs) That's what I heard. (laughs) That's, I mean, that's a lot to have heard. So thank you for taking me on that journey. (laughs) I'm curious what you think about the idea of kind of juxtaposing in this like nostalgic chorus, uh, this line about going to see the cure and then also kind of just softening the blow a little bit by then saying, listening to our favorite songs. Like it sort of feels like astrology a little bit where they're being Mm. seemingly very specific. They are hanging out, listening to the cure, but they're also just in a parking lot listening to our favorite songs. Like those could be (laughs) any fucking band. It doesn't have to be the cure. Like it it sort of feels immediate and intimate, but then also is like highly applicable to any listener's life. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, it's, it's crowd pandering, but it's a good, it's, it's a good lyrical device. It Mm -hmm. works. But yeah, it's cheap. I mean, the idea being that your job is to insert your favorite song and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, the song is about my favorite song. Yeah. Like, no, it's not. It's about anything. Yeah. And all the people I <laughs> lost in San Diego. 
Well, yeah, uh, I think I think perhaps another reason why I'm a particularly p- poor uh, music journalist to, to look at Blink-182 is I grew up in New England, which is about as far from San Diego <laughs> as you can possibly get, and uh, musically uh, bereft, and no, I shouldn't say bereft, but musically could not be more different. I think all my friends, when I, when, when, when I, when I could have been listening to Blink-182, were instead in basements listening to really intense hardcore bands instead. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's it. Like, if you're in New England, you at least you had, like, Boston hardcore, there was... If you were in sure. indie rock, you had the Pixies. So you had a lot of other stuff that wasn't just like extremely sophomoric skate punk to get into. I was I was distrustful of the lightheartedness of anything from California where I now live <laughs> and thoroughly enjoy. I think I was needing the joy. Right. But there's something wrong with people who don't experience winter. I'm inclined to agree with you. <laughs> For sure. And so, uh, so uh, this that was so great. I feel like I have no question that's like going to match that sort of level of uh, of insight on this song. When you do that sort of a deep dive on it, is that something that mm-hmm. leaves you on a personal level uh, ultimately appreciative? So you talked about first listen, you talked about second listen. Mm-hmm. Will mm-hmm. there be a third and a fourth listen for you of this song? Or does that is that for you like a way of putting the song to bed? Like you've sort of done all your thinking you need to do about San Diego by Blink-182. I think there's a sort of less analytical and scientific uh, part of this question, which is simply, do you remember the hook? Does it stick around? And I think that the chorus is catchy. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely, even even the post-chorus, the terrible word San Diego. Again, I'm, <laughs> I'm very sorry to everybody from San Diego. Beautiful place. But it just, it's not a poetic word. Um, it, I mean, similarly, like you wouldn't sing New England it, New England. It just, it, yeah. it's not. Billy Bragg's allowed uh, to sing about New England, but there's literally <laughs> the one song. I mean, I'm from a suburb yep. of Toronto called Etobicoke, and I don't know that that's ever really been effectively worked into into a melody, although maybe it hasn't. If it hasn't, maybe. I like Etobicoke. That could work. Yeah, but we, we also have to acknowledge <laughs> Billy Bragg's better song is, of course, California Stars anyway. Right. So we got, <laughs> yeah. it all comes back to California. Yeah. Uh, but that's, gr- that's with the assist from, uh, oh, my God, uh, Jesus, uh, that whole album is lyrics by, uh, um, oh my God, this is going to kill me. I'm going to with, with Wilco. Yeah. But, but they're all, it's, it's all based on, um, uh, Woody Guthrie lyrics on, oh, on, is it? yeah. So all, so California well, stars is actually credit to, uh, to Woody Guthrie. That's, imba- I'm going to leave that in. That's like the sound of me Googling mermaid Avenue, but an excellent <laughs> album and probably, uh, I don't know if it's a better Billy Bragg song, but it's definitely up there. It makes me think of, I don't know if it's sacrilege to bring in another band of the same era and ilk, but there's a great modern Weezer song called California Kids, which is a song that Rivers Cuomo wrote about what sounds like it's like, hey, I'm a 17 year old living in California is really cool. And like I get on my skateboard and life's awesome. But it's actually this undercover song where he's writing uh, to his children He's from somewhere cold. I can't remember, but not California. Yeah. And he's and he's upset that his kids will be California kids and know nothing but California because life is too joyous and you have to know the pains of life. That's sort of so the, rad. Is the purpose of the track. <laughs> yeah, it's a really fun song. Have you ever listened to his episode of Song Exploder where he uh, talks about that guy is mad? That he's episode is out of his nuts. mind. He's out of his mind. He every song is written in a Google spreadsheet. Yeah, like with the he's syllables nuts. and then where the like emphasis sits on each syllable. Like it's very, <laughs> it's a pretty, it's a pretty fascinating thing. Hard plug for that episode of song exploder. It's, it's a, brilliant. It's a good one. So have you, uh, reconvened with your brother? Let him know, Hey, I was wrong about <laughs> blink. I spent some time with this song, San Diego. I get what you were all about in high school. Yeah. I think I owe him a phone call. I definitely <laughs> do. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, and back to your question of like, is this song going to recur? I know I'm not sure. I'm going to go, I, I, since I'm not a deep fan and I don't know their entire oeuvre, like I'm, I'm probably not going to go listen to the most recent album. Instead, I'd probably rather go back and start from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I probably definitely spend some time driving down highway one in California, listening to blink 182. It's fun. Like there's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. I think probably my, my younger self would be fairly upset at the fact that I have let go of all of my younger self's, supposed critical thinking and taste, but eh, whatever these guys, I mean, I, I, I kind of get it now. You're like, Oh, you grew up in San Diego. 
you've got a whole world of feelings, but overwhelmingly your feeling is like upbeat energy and excitement. And I dig that. That's something I need more of in my life. <laughs> That's fair. So, uh, Charlie, besides uh, Switched on Pop, which we've talked about uh, several times and obviously is a podcast that contains just the kind of insight that you demonstrated uh, uh, flexing on this song, is there anything else yeah. that uh, you should be promoting that you would like to promote uh, that the Blink-155 Nation should be all about besides Carl Wilson's book and an episode of Song Exploder? Oh my gosh, I'm too mired in the world of of, of politics right now, as too many people are. And right. I listen to like <laughs> I religiously listen to the daily every single morning, first thing, and then I'm like NPR up front or up, NPR is up first, and then I'm just like too many political podcasts and filling my life with that. And so, frankly, I don't want to plug any of that. I want to plug the things that provide people a, a sense of like space outside of the overtly. Of overt darkness of our politics, but everything is political. Our music is political, right? I mm-hmm. mean, it's it's all in there. The monoculture is political. Um, I have a lot of really exciting things. This is this is my way of talking around all the things that I can't announce that I really want to announce. There's a lot of fun stuff coming up with uh, with Switched On Pop that will be. Um, be talking about really soon. Awesome. I can't say anything. Well, we'll yet. put a link to switch on pop's Twitter and your Twitter in the description. So people can follow those and see, and see what happens with those very secretive announcements that you're teasing us with. <laughs> Thanks, man. This has been a, a great deal of fun. Yeah, dude. Thank you so much for your time. Mm-hmm.